What's up, everyone? Welcome to Game Face episode 24 on your Wednesday. I think we're starting to settle into the groove here on Wednesdays. Yeah, we're getting there. I think it's actually probably the best day to do it. I don't know how it does for our streaming numbers as far as the number of people, because I can never tell how many people watch the live stream by the time we're done and wrap everything up. But I know for me personally, Wednesdays turn into a good day because Tuesday's insane with all the game releases and mm. getting all that stuff organized. And... Uh, it's also good because the games have come out the day before and we have plenty to talk about usually on a Wednesday. So, I don't know. Leave it in the comments, guys, what days work best for you for our live stream and we'll try to adjust. But I think right now, Wednesdays are working out pretty well for us, at least on our side. Mm -hmm. And maybe someone in the chat can kind of monitor the number of people watching and at the yeah. end of the show, someone can tell us like what the peak or someone who's been watching the show a long time and knows what our numbers were back when we were doing it every Thursday versus doing it on Wednesdays. Yeah. show's kind of jumped around for a while. We've kind of settled in here on Wednesdays. Tokyo Game Show going on right now, Matt. Yeah. Uh, and actually a fair amount of actual good stuff coming yeah. out of it, which is surprising because for <laughs> it's years amazing. it's been the put, put you to sleep mobile game show. Yeah, I mean, I think the show probably still, if we were actually at the show, yeah, would probably would, yeah. be just like it has been the last four or five years. But as far as news and new media and new games being announced, it's been a good show already and it's really just the first day in Japan right now. Keep in mm -hmm. mind, Japan's always a day ahead of us and the show kicked off on Thursday, so it's going on right now. So... Square Enix continue to relentlessly screw with Kingdom Hearts fans. Yeah, so. yeah, we'll get into them, all that stuff. In fact, if you don't like Japanese games, this is probably going to be your least favorite episode of Game Face ever because it <laughs> is lot. really. There's a couple things we're going to talk about that aren't related to Japanese gaming, but for the most part, it waste is a lot of time on Weeaboo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of Japanese games on this show, and as it should be, as Tokyo Game Show, Japan is the cradle of our industry. We should all show some respect and at least have one week where we kind of set it aside and talk about what's going on over there. Uh, before we jump into the big six, though, we should probably talk about Forza a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to talk about it as a topic on today's show. Our game eval is up, obviously, already. You've probably seen it on the site, so read that if you really want a detailed impressions of the game, but I have not had a chance to play even a second of the game yet. And Matt, you've played a couple hours. What are your initial impressions? Uh, it's really good. Um, I'm like, I think I'm in the third series of races now. Like, I mean, you, what, you can pick whatever you want, but I'm just sticking with the linear progression. Um, but it's really cool. Uh, it, I know one thing, it looks amazing. It looks incredible. It's the best looking Xbox oh, One game so by far. far. By by a, far. And it runs rock solid, rock solid 60, 60 frames. Yeah. Um, the, like in the middle of the first like, main series of races, I got, like, I unlocked like a, a showcase. And let, let me, it was a, like basically an F1, like an indie challenge. Yeah. And like you did seven laps around the Indianapolis, and it's so fast. Yeah. Like, like it's the sense of so, the 60 the sense frames. Of speed is insane. <laughs> like I would, like I felt dizzy by the end of wow. it. Wow. It, it was, I was like, oh my god, I can't do it. Because like, it it's so, <laughs> like, you're used to fast, but you're not used to that smooth. Yeah. And it's just, and it's just, it's like butter. Well, and it's then, like people always say you can't see. The difference between thirty no, you, frames. You no, can. you totally can. Like you that's can. a big wide sure. tail. Like, like even if you don't think you can, I think you can. And I'm for sure you can feel it oh, when yeah. a game's controls update sixty times a second. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And when it matches the frame rate, there's just nothing else like that. I'm not a frame rate crazy person. Yeah, like, not either. I'm like, usually as long fine as it's with solid. 30, but... If it's a solid thirty, I'm fine. But that six, the solid sixty is a treat. Yeah, it really is. And uh, I did. You know, the night races are great, and the weather is amazing. You know, I mean, the weather. Maybe it's not visually speaking as amazing quite so much as drive clubs, where yeah. like you know just like the water on the windshield. But F1 it's still there. Is really good with with weather too. Yeah, but the the drops in the hood and the windshield are still there. And the main thing you know, I know, like people kind of made fun of him in '83 when they talked about you know our our puddles are yeah. volumetric or whatever. You know, yeah. you feel it like you, yeah. when you go through a puddle, that car that car you pulls lose it a little and, bit. and it changes. Like you know, the puddles can be deeper or wider on the next lap and stuff. I mean, it's it's amazing. Like cool. it really feels good. So yeah, I'm very early into it, but I'm pretty damn happy with it so far. All right. So with that, it's time to get to the big six. <laughs> So, Matt, mm -hmm. a lot of past some time ago. Not sure that I've still gotten completely over it. I still feel like there's a bit of a dark spot in my soul. No, that is a, uh, that is, that is a big change in the industry as a whole, not just Nintendo. And, and especially I, for I it to happen yeah, so young. So young and so soon and in the middle of such a transitional period for the company. It's a, it's a 
like it's a tragedy on like every imaginable level. Yeah. Basically. And Nintendo took its sweet time picking a new president. It did finally pick the new president this week. And the guy is an HR guy, Matt. He's been with the company a long time. He's actually worked at NOA, NOA which is mm-hmm. I think is a That's big good. deal. Because one thing I would say is I feel like Nintendo had got a little tone deaf with the West. They've been getting better the last couple years, but... Actually, not just lately. Like, for the last, like, two decades, I feel like they haven't really had a good idea of what the West wants. Yeah. And so... There's always been kind of a father-knows-best sort right. of thing going on there. Even when Howard Lincoln was running NOA back in, like, the N64 era, like, it was always a struggle for NOA to get anything done when they were working with NOJ. Mm-hmm. And uh, so now they finally have somebody running Nintendo proper who used to work in North America and understands... The challenges of the market, the demands of the market. So in that way, I would say, good hire. But pulling someone who works in like the human resources department, it's an interesting angle. I mean, I mean, you have to assume they have their reasons. And now, you know, now that uh, uh, they did what they did with Miyamoto. Yeah, because uh, so so now <laughs> Miyamoto, his title is Creative Fellow. Hmm. <laughs> Whatever that is. Jolly good fellow, I mean, perhaps. you know, this guy is a little older. Um, yeah. He's, Miyamoto is getting up there a little bit, but I almost wonder, I would say, is he, was Miyamoto not old enough to be the president of Nintendo? That's possible. But I, I wonder if, you know. After Yamauchi, who was like 80 when he finally stepped yeah. down. Well, I mean, and I wonder if, like, Miyamoto would even want that position. Yeah. Because, like, you know, he's, a, he's the creative guy, and, like, you step into that, you know, that president position and, you know, all the fun goes away, yeah. essentially. You know, I mean, all... I can say that from personal experience, right. you know, working at GT. Like, when I first started working there, I was the editor-in-chief, and I loved my job. And then the site exploded, and I got promoted to vice president and started running, like, a bunch of other websites. And, like, I didn't like my job so much anymore. Yeah. It was like, you weren't, you aren't hands on. And, look, it takes a certain kind of person to just show up at work every day and just tell people what to do. Mm-hmm. Instead of being able to go to work and actually glean some enjoyment out of doing instead of just telling. And so... That was always a challenge for me as a VP at Viacom was not getting involved in the doing and just doing the telling mm-hmm. part of it. And so maybe that was part of the angle that they took with this guy. I think so. I mean, if you, it's all it, that's, I think probably Miyamoto is more valuable, you know, creating rather oh, than for running. Oh, sure. And for it's sure. like you know, like as Usama Dyson said in uh, Macross Plus, you get promoted too high, you can't fly anymore. Yeah. Oh, you it's know? true. So. It's, it's totally true. And then the other thing about this guy is uh, reportedly, this guy was completely down on the Wii U before launch. He was the guy in the room who said, this isn't going to work, this is going to flop, people aren't going to be able to tell... And I think his exact words were, people are not going to be able to tell the difference between this and the Wii. Wow. And so... Listen to that guy. I mean, exactly. <laughs> like, so maybe that's what they're looking at. Maybe is, so. Because a lot of... Look, a lot of times when you're that malcontent guy in meetings or in business in general, you end up getting, like, squeezed out. Because a lot of times... We what just talked about Marty O'Donnell right, last week. right. Because a lot of times what people want is they want a yes man. The, mm-hmm. the, the, big, the big wigs want somebody underneath them who are just going to say, yeah, right, you're so smart, yeah. and this is going to work great. And take their bad ideas and make them good. Right, somehow. and try to make them good even if it's possible. Yeah. And, and so, one, I'm impressed that this guy didn't get squeezed out of Nintendo because Nintendo's corporate culture is notoriously that way, where if you have, like, where Nintendo, if you're the ripple, they smooth your ass out, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and so this guy was a ripple, and they kept him around, like, all this time. And maybe this is what helped him ascend to his new position, yeah. is the fact that he was the one guy in the room that said, you know what? Maybe this doesn't work. Yeah. So it's like, cause Normally it's like, don't be the squawky Pokemon, because right. <laughs> they can get 50 more of you out of the tall grass. <laughs> That's pretty good. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a wait-and-see thing. I also wonder, too, if, you know, he is older, and so I wonder if this is just kind of like a stopgap thing where they're going to put him in, in place and then wait until a Miyamoto mm-hmm. or a Numa, a Numa or someone is ready to maybe. take that post and but, is ready or maybe to step like, away. You know, if he really did see the Wii U's faults ahead of time, maybe maybe he's the right guy to kind of lead them into the NX world it could era. Be. I mean, one thing he has said that he he's not really going to change a lot about... Mm-hmm the path that Iwata had set them on. So they're still going to do Nintendo Directs. Um, they're not changing anything about the NX. Like, that whole plan is going to go as, as planned. They're not going to jump out of mobile now. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the things that Iwata put in place right before he passed away are going to continue on. So 
It doesn't look like he's going to come in and like shake up the boat and throw people overboard and that type of thing. But uh, it'll be a, year one. It, it's kind of hard to come in and make a big change in one year. Yeah. I think year two is where we'll really see him at him as a leader and his policies and his ideas kind of taking shape. Mm -hmm. It'll be an interesting time. And yeah, I'm, I would imagine Iwata had quite. You know, I think we knew they knew. I mean, I don't think a lot of people knew, but he knew what was coming. To some degree, so, oh, for sure. I, so I'm sure he had a roadmap laid out. I'm sure it was discussed, and they have, they have a plan. I, I don't know what that plan is. Yeah, and, I think we'll uh, find out. I think we'll all find out. We'll all, we'll all find out. Uh, hopefully, not the hard way, but uh, it's uh, it's going to be a very interesting next two three years for Nintendo. I think and it'll be interesting too to see if this guy steps forward and becomes the face because. Yeah. You gotta remember, Awada was the guy who was doing all the Nintendo Directs. He was the host for that. He would go on their stage for E3, although they don't mm -hmm. really do their E3 shows anymore. But... but he was like very young and kind of he was in touch, and he like you know he's very entertaining. He was a good on camera presence. Like yeah. I wonder, I wonder if the new president does that, or if they find someone else internally who's like ready for that, or like I'm, I wonder where you go with that. And I wonder too if. You know, this E3, I'm guessing, is when we'll see the NX for the first time. Yeah. So I wonder that, in conjunction with the new leadership, if we'll get a Nintendo press conference at E3 this year. Well, maybe they'll just make a new Muppet. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> the Muppets make me sad now. I know. Like, like you worry, like, what happened to the Iwata Muppet? Is, it, is, it in like a, is it in, like, a shrine yeah. somewhere? Even like... now when I just see Muppets, like, I get this, like, wave of sadness that overcomes me. Even if it's not, like, that, those Muppets. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just any, like, puppet now, I'm like, oh, like, I don't know. I'll get over it eventually. But, yeah. I mean, do you launch a new console with a Nintendo Direct? Like, do you show it for the first time in a Nintendo Direct? I would hope not, but I mean, on one hand, but like, I don't know, maybe we're too old-fashioned. Maybe Could maybe be. it's just as good to show it to the internet. I mean, I mean look. That's, that's where my, the audience is. From my personal perspective, I would prefer to watch it in a Nintendo Direct instead yeah. of going through the whole rigmarole of going to the press conference and yeah. getting all your credentials. And, and, then, I, and I still say, like, you know... It's Nintendo. Like, people are going to be interested, people are going to cover it, people are going to look at it no matter what. So why spend all that extra money to rent out the Kodak Theater or whatever that, and, and, and get everybody there and, and feed them all or whatever, you know, everything you're going to do. And have demo kiosks set up afterwards. Yeah, all, and all that, that stuff. stuff. Like, why not just, you know, put out a well-produced video that explain? you know, because that's the other thing is, like, one of the problems with the Wii U is nobody really understood what it was after yeah. that press conference, you know? Mm -hmm. I remember being on headset with everybody after the press conference arguing over with, like, three different people over, like, whether it was a Wii expansion controller right. or, like, an actual new system, and we had to wait for the press release to actually come in through email and explain what it was. Yeah. And, like, you know, I well, think they, you, you well, avoid they... that if you can, you know, pre-produce this thing, show it to people, get an idea, get some feedback, and make it what it needs to be. Well, one thing about Nintendo is that when they do show their hardware, they generally do let the journalists immediately play them. And it was the same way with mm. the Wii U. Like, as soon as it was over, we went backstage, and they had they only had, like, 20 kiosks set up or whatever. But they were there, so you mm. could try them. Well, I think I, if I were them, uh, and I'm not saying I'm as smart as Nintendo, but uh, if I were them, I would do a Nintendo Direct, and then I would ha also have, like, an event for the press to come put their hands on it, like, around that time. Yeah. About, the, about maybe the same time you put up the Direct. Or maybe you... You know, you have a smaller kind of thing. You maybe you don't you don't have to like do it up. Maybe you have the press sit in a theater and watch the direct along with everybody else live, and then they can go in and do their thing. The other thing I would say too, in watching the B roll that we're running right now, is what happened to the Wii U? Like watching this now, like I still want one. <laughs> like, yeah, like a lot of these tricks they show in the original <laughs> things that never happened. Yeah, I mean, some of them would happen in like one little mini game somewhere, but like they never really built on all the. Look at all the stuff yeah. that it supposed was supposed to do, and like it just never, it never came to fruition. That's kind of like I wonder, like you know, and I I do think that Zelda is moving to the NX. But, yeah, yeah but, I think that's pretty much a given at this. But point. what if the Wii U version, or what if it's still, what if it stays on the Wii U? What if it's the Zelda Wii U game ends up being where they put all these great ideas they had that they never got to use in anything else, and it's just like this last sort of hurrah yeah, like, for this weird-ass system. See, we showed you. We were right all along. Yeah, you know, all you had to do was wait four years. Yeah. <laughs> well, it'll be interesting to watch over the coming years. It'll be interesting to see how long that guy stays on, because I really yeah. wonder if he's the long-term solution there, if he's just kind of like this middle guy until they find, maybe, I wouldn't say better, but... They find maybe a more permanent solution yeah. to the presidency there, but I can't. I can't see Miyamoto not eventually becoming president of Nintendo. Like whether he's 
75 or 80 when it happens, and he is just kind of like the figurehead like Yamauchi was, and he just sits up on high saying, da, 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 da. <laughs> like, I have a feeling someday he will be the president of Nintendo. I just I, don't think it's there yet. I don't know if he wants to, if, ever, if he'll ever want to do that. I don't know if that he's the, I don't know if he's president material in his own mind. Like, he could be get tired of those late hours developing games, though. Yeah, but he also kind of looks, I, I, Miyamoto is like, Energy wise is a little Stan Lee ish in the yeah, sense yeah. it's like, wow, you you have more energy than I do, and you're yeah. like forty years older than me. It's like <laughs> it, it's it's like you know, I feel like that might be what gives him his life doing okay, that. Me. You know, maybe that's you if that's right. what if that's what he loves, he shouldn't stop doing it because that's what's keeping him young. Agreed. All right, so we are going to break out a couple of the games from Tokyo Game Show, like the bigger stuff. We're going to break out into separate topics, and the first one of those is Bloodborne. So. At Sony's press conference for TGS, they showed the first ever footage of Bloodborne DLC, Matt. Have you got a look at the trailer? Yeah, I watched the trailer on, on my Sift. Um, very cool. Um, I have to say, like one of my disappointments with Dark Souls 2 was that there wasn't like horrible, gross stuff in it, like the gaping yeah. dragon and stuff yeah, from yeah. Dark Souls 1. And I'm kind of glad that Bloodborne is really kind of... They took that aspect of Dark Souls and really doubled down on they it. Did, and yeah. like, it's just... There is just some horrific stuff in this game, and the the DLC trailer, like even more so. Like they they're they're really going for broke on it, and I like that. I love this trailer. And here's the thing, man. This game frustrates me to no end because mm. I I love everything about this game, man. <laughs> I really do. Like I love the aesthetic. I love all the ideas behind it. I love the design of it. I just don't have the time in my life anymore to play games yeah, like this. That that weapon is awesome. Oh yeah! Like I love I love the 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 rotating blade weapon. Yeah. And all that. There's some there's just great ideas. Like, but you're right. I love that game. I just haven't got around to really digging too far into it beyond that when we first played it when it came out. Yeah, and I mean, look, I my girlfriend got a PS4 for it. Like that was how that far was, did she make it? She got distracted by a bunch of rhythm games, so gotcha. she has, she's she's not a couple hours in, but like but that was like she's a huge Castlevania fan, and she saw that as the successor to Castlevania to her. Basically. See, I almost see this game as like the next Resident Evil Four in a lot of ways. Like I get the same vibe from this game as I got from Resident Evil Four, but I just I can't spend like an hour trying to beat yeah. like one section of a game. But look just, how awesome that is! Every it's, the whole thing is awesome. The art's incredible. The technical side of it's incredible and so i guess my question and the reason i want to bring up this topic is is like will this dlc convince you to go back and play it some more yeah maybe i, mm. <laughs> I, I was about to say like well maybe next year but then like q1 next year is looking horrifying loaded. i mean it's just loaded it's, it's i mean a, we're pretty much loaded up from now until like e3. may of next year yeah, yeah. it's it's a avalanche if it's unless, great unless any unless a bunch of stuff slips but they might right and then that's not even including all the stuff that has no release date. Where the hell is a drift? Yeah. Um, but it's. Uh, I mean, I I want to go back and play it, but it's just one of those things where I know it's something's gonna slip. I mean, I'm in the middle of three open world games simultaneously right now. Yeah. I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen. I gotta get one of them done before Fallout. I still haven't even finished The Witcher Three. So. Me neither. That's that's <laughs> one of them. I'm I'm juggling The Witcher Three and MGS Five and uh, Mad Max. Yeah, I mean right I pushed now. through MGS Five for our gaming vow, obviously, but yeah, I mean I'm still I'm probably only halfway through Witcher Three still. Yep. So I just pick it up here and there, but then it's like I play it for like a night, and then the next day I have to pick up something else to play for the site or yep. to make sure I'm informed for our the sh for Game Face mm -hmm. or whatever. It's like there's always something else coming up, and that's why that's probably part of the reason I was so mad about Bloodborne when it came out that it was still really challenging. Was I, I knew then that I was probably never going to be able to finish the game. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. I think this game know, is made for me. Everything about it is made for everything I love about games, except for its difficulty. I think. See, that's the thing. Is like, I mean, I've been through Dark Souls. I never finished Demon Souls because I think Demon Souls is. I think Demon Souls is a little clunky, a little like janky, a little yeah. clunky. Yeah. I think Dark Souls sort of nailed the formula down. Dark Souls Two went an interesting, interesting direct direction with it, but I think Scholar of the First Sin addresses a lot of the problems people had with it. It's a, that's a really good update of it. And then, but I think I think Bloodborne is actually easier than the Dark Souls game. It is. I'd agree with um, that. Yeah. Not easy by modern gaming standards, but like I don't, I think I don't get quite as angry when I played Bloodborne. Bloodborne. Dark I don't Souls. really get angry playing games at all. Although I did get angry playing Metal Gear Solid <laughs> Five. Uh, I mentioned it in our game. Well, you about. don't like to be insulted, right? So. Yeah, <laughs> like cutscenes. <laughs> 
No, it wasn't that anymore got me mad. Yeah. There's just the one thing I was talking about last week. There's that one part of the game. Right. Like, I don't know if you've got to it yet. No, I'm, I haven't really gotten too far. I'm, again, yeah. like, I log in for the daily bonuses, and then I, like, usually end up playing, like, a side ops mission. Yeah. And then... I just like the the story missions are so involved to me that I'm just like oh I can't do that right now I got to time do wise are yeah. involved yeah so yeah I haven't really made a lot I got quiet I mean I I you know I can use quiet now so I've been doing mostly doing that and marveling at how easy the game is now yeah it does make it really easy and with, later on when you get her sniper rifle upgraded when she has like the trank darts with the with the silencer right. on it. It's just like an S rank factor. You just sit there and you just watch doink, 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 <laughs> everybody going to sleep all around you. It's kind of awesome the first couple mm. times, but then you realize I don't have to do anything anymore. Right. Well, like early on, I was like kind of reluctant to try her and because and, I like the dog, because the dog would sniff, yeah, yeah. sniff guys out. And then like you're like, no, uh, Quiet sniffs them out and kills them. And I'm yeah. like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that solves that problem. It does. Anyway, yeah, we got back on Metal Gear somehow. Metal we were Gear. trying to talk about Bloodborne, but. They take they took a little while to show up the first DLC for this. They did, um, but it's, at the same time, it's kind of like this seems like the right place. TGS does seems it like though? A, I don't I know so. if TGS is the right place to show off anything but a JRPG at this point. Maybe not, but like I mean, technically, this is a JRPG. Yeah, I mean, it's an RPG made action RPG made in Japan, but like yeah. um, it's also like it's it's weird enough that it's it's kind of fits the it fits the bill and it's. You know, it's from software. They're they're a venerable Japanese game developer that yeah. you know again has a history of jank, but has like really stepped their game up for this series. And uh, yeah, I I I think it's as good a place as any. And it didn't get lost in the shuffle. Is the important part? Yeah, is like you would you would probably lose this game in the in the in the noise and the signal uh, at Gamescom or E3 for sure. Yeah, and it's at uh, two million worldwide now sales. That's good. Which is good. Which means you can pretty much guarantee that if they have plans to do a sequel, it's going to make it. So, yep. all you Dark Bloodborne Soul. fans out there, you have that to look forward to. I think it's pretty much a given. You'll probably get a Bloodborne too. And if uh, From Software doesn't want to do it, Sony will just throw enough money at them to make them do it. I'm guessing. Yeah. Chuhei, big fan. Yeah, I think. From, I think From Software will just become like the new uh, the new platinum. Yeah. Where it's just like, oh, anything you want us to be sure, just bring it in. Bring it speaking in. Speaking we'll of it. speaking of from software, I don't know if you saw it or not, but we we did curate this to sifted, but Game Informer right now has like a monthly exclusive or month long exclusive on Dark Souls three. Mm -hmm. And so as they often do, they go to the studio to handle a lot of the coverage and whatnot. And so they went there and one of the articles that they posted up digitally was a tour of From Software. Did hmm. you see that I story by any that. chance? They have photos of like their offices, and oh my god, like what? it is literally like a room. I don't know, probably five times the size of the studio. I realize you guys can't see how big our studio is. Not huge. It's small. Yeah. yeah. So it's like five times the size of our studio, and there's like a hundred people in there. Oh my god. Like they're all just at like <laughs> flat desks with computers. There's no dividers in between them. Like, mm. and look. That's the way it is in Japan. Like most companies, that's the way they operate. Oh, yeah. That's the way their offices are. So, you know, when people always say, oh, I hate my cube, I'm like, man, you should go to Japan and walk into like any of their offices and see how the people there work. And, and you will love the yeah. fact that you have a cube with walls. Or like the, um, you yeah, know, we went, I remember we went to, uh, this was years, it was like 10 years ago, more or more, but we went to uh, Polyphony. Polyphony yeah, Digital. I've been there. Yeah, to, you know, Gran Turismo. And Their they, offices are nice. They, are, they have nice offices, yeah. re wonderful offices, and they've got like a, there's like a car elevator that can yeah. bring a car into the cubicle area, yeah. so they can look at the car while they design the digital version. But we were walking around that place, and all you know, all the cute, all the desks are very low, and there's not really a lot. Of, and then at one point, somebody looked, I uh, was looking around, and like noticed that there's like everybody had tons of stuff under their desk, and it turned out that all the stuff was like the developers. Like it was people. There were sleeping. all every every desk had a person in a sleeping bag underneath it. They also have like uh, sleeping cabins yes. at Polyphony. Like literally, they're like lockers that people climb up and crawl into, and then they shut the door behind them. It's like those mm -hmm. pod hotels in Japan. Yeah. yeah, I remember my trip to Polyphony when I went there one time. I was like, whoa. And of course, it's all like the design, the visual design of the studio is, is like a um, a parking garage. Yeah, it's not not the most aesthetically pleasing place to sit. It's all a day. cool office. It's though. a cool Their office. Their offices but... are like new and chic and cool, yeah. but yeah, like the culture is still there. Yeah, and it's an it is in a nice area. It's a very no, no. 
it, you think it's in a nice area? Yeah, I, I thought it was pretty. I don't think there's any bad areas in Tokyo. No, I just mean it was pretty. It was, uh, it was a little okay. more. It was more had more more green. Yeah, it was you. outside of town a little bit. It wasn't yeah. like in the heart of everything. It reminded me of, of like the the little like kind of neighborhood of Shenmue. Yeah, yeah. Like, I've oh. never went anywhere in Tokyo that I felt even vaguely unsafe. Oh no, like, well, there is no bad part of town there. The only place I thought was felt vaguely unsafe was the place with uh, all the Americans. Yeah. Like, Rapongi at yeah. night yeah. with all the Rapongi at night's a little, a little creepy because you're like, man, look at all the white people. Like, no. it's just like, it's like, What's it's like creepy about it is the prostitutes that are constantly coming up to you, trying to drag you like into their building, man. That is, yeah, you're right though. That is yeah. the only place where it does feel a little like weird and edgy. Yeah, and but, that's where the naval base. But once is. you get away from the expats, yeah, it's, it's once great. you get away from the white people, it's all good. <laughs> So you say you will put, pick up Bloodborne again. I'm saying I probably won't because I feel like I need to finish the base game before yeah. I start playing DLC. I intend to. I just don't know when I will. Yeah. I just, I just, my schedule's very full from here until about mid 2017. Yeah. You know? So maybe a bunch of stuff will slip and there'll be like a nice little like two week gap where I can get in some Bloodborne in like February or something. I wish, a year I wish from you when luck it came out. On yeah. That one. I really don't see it happening, man. I just think. I'm probably just going to have to chalk that one up to... Or No finish. Man's Sky could come out and you might never see me again. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe someday when I'm retired, I'll, then I'll be too <laughs> old and my reflexes won't be there to finish it. So. Exactly. <laughs> all right. So it's time to move on to the next topic. And the next topic is a game that we've all been hoping and praying for for... I guess it's been what? 11 years. 11 years. We've if you been, don't count the episodes. Yeah, yeah. 11 years. And if you count the episodes, it's like still like still 10. Still pretty... Yeah. Yeah. Nine or ten, yeah. Half-Life 3. So, the topic doesn't come up that often anymore, but this week, one of the developers at Naughty Dog, Neil Druckmann, tweeted at Valve and just said, (laughs) Yo, bro, why don't you guys just give us the Half-Life 3 license, and we'll take care of that. We'll do it. We'll take care of that little problem for you. Druckmann! Yeah. (laughs) How do you feel about that, Matt? I can't think of anyone I would trust more really? with, with that, frankly. I mean, if I had to give it to someone who wasn't Valve, Naughty Dog's pretty far up there in terms of at least they'd take the narrative and run with it, you know? Narratively, I, I would agree with you. I would think Naughty Dog would do a yeah. good job with the story. Well, I don't think it would be a first-person shooter anymore. That's my that's the thing. So, Naughty Dog's never really made a first-person shooter. They've mm-hmm. made third-person shooters that some people would argue are good or awful, depending yeah. on your perspective. Um but they've never made a first-person shooter before. Mm-hmm. And so your contention is that you don't think that they would make a, thir- a first-person I, shooter. I feel like they wouldn't. I don't... I don't. Here's the thing. Like, the thing about Half-Life 3 at this point is, like, what in the world could they do with Half-Life 3? Not, not just Naughty Dog. Anyone. Valve. Anyone. Yeah. What can they do with Half-Life 3 that would live up to what we think Half-Life 3 might be? Like, what is there left to do with the first-person shooter genre? That I mean, w- look, that I'll be perfectly like, honest with you. Like, I am so desperate for it. That I would take whatever I can get at this point. Mm-hmm. But I'm wondering if, like, if you know, Naughty Dog's very character. Do you think Naughty Dog would make a Half Life game where Gordon Freeman doesn't speak? I don't think they. Yeah, it'd be a good challenge for him. Yeah, but like, it's also like it feels so artificial now that I, you know, it, it's it's such a different world. It's a different medium now, and I don't know if Half Life can carry forward in that un, in an unchanged state now. I think that might be part of maybe that's part of why it still hasn't come out maybe Valve has made like 15 versions of it where it's like this just doesn't oh look I'm sure they've anymore. made at least a few like yeah. there's no way they just totally turn their back on it no matter how successful Steam is there's no way they completely turn their back on Half-Life they yeah. never thought about it or worked on prototypes I'm sure it's in there but it's just like it's how hard would it be is it you know when I think about what you know Half-Life 3 it's like yes I want Half-Life 3 but then I think about what Half-Life 3 would be and I'm trying to imagine a Half-Life 3 where it feels fresh and and impressive and amazing the way Half-Life 2 did after Half-Life 1 or the way Half-Life 1 did after playing all those old first-person shooters that had no story, had no cinematic sensibility, anything like that. Well, here's the thing. When they released Portal as Portal, they set back Half-Life <laughs> five or six years. Yeah. Because, I mean, look, Half-Life 2, the gravity gun was a big thing. And look, to be perfectly honest with you, I would play another game with the gravity gun right now. Yeah. I have no problem with that. Like, they did not ring that for all it was worth. There was just one game with it, so... Yeah. 
And no one copied it, really. No, it's never been done by anyone else. Like, people have worked with gravity in games, and, you know, obviously physics mm -hmm. have gotten a lot better in games in general over the last decade or so, but no one has still really used a gravity gun in a, in a video game. And so I feel like that's still right. But, you know, they, the portal gun, that could have been something that could have bolstered the next mm. episode. Well, I think everybody thought that's where they were going, with because like, portal was very heavily implied to be in the same universe. Right. So I think a lot of people thought that's where they were going, but now... You know what? It's been eight years since Portal One, so you know, yeah. like where you know, it, it's. I, I understand. I mean, I think Druckmann's coming from the same place we are, where he's just like, "Look, if you don't want to do it, we'll like, let know, me do, we'll it. do it." Like it's like because <laughs> I think he wants it too. For you know, sure, he wants to yeah, play yeah. that game too, and so like uh, it's an inter it's an interesting way to try to kick Valve in the ass a little bit and, and say like, hey. Like, well, here's the thing. Valve just completely dodged Ignored it. it. They yeah. dodged it and just totally blew them off. Yeah. Like, <laughs> didn't reply to it. You would think at least Gaben would come back with something snarky or funny, yeah. but no. Like, <laughs> here's the thing. Like, I honestly think this could happen. Yeah. I seriously think it is a possibility that they could make this happen. I could see. I think the conversation could happen at the very least. Yeah. I think the conversation may have already happened. Mm. Like, these guys all know each other. Yeah. And so, look, Druckmann could have easily approached someone from Valve in person mm -hmm. at some event, an award show. He could have called them or texted them or emailed them. But he made it public. Like, he mm -hmm. did it on Twitter. And so, to me, that adds a little more weight to this whole thing. Like, yeah. Well, especially because we're in, a, you know, and I wonder how much of it was motivated by the idea. We're in, we're in an era now... Where all the games we thought were never going to happen looks like they're going to happen. Right. We got a Shenmue three. We got a Final Fantasy seven remake. We've got you know, it's it's crazy. Like how much of this stuff that was like kind of a pipe dream is now like oh, this might actually happen. Yeah. You know? So so Half Life three is sort of the last holdout of the you know the last Guardian. Like they're, they're like here's the, the thing. They're the last holdout of the 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 imaginary game. Here's what could hold everything back though is that Naughty Dog is a second party developer. And so anything that they work on, getting that onto any other platforms, PC, I could see, mm -hmm. maybe, because it's not a direct they, competitor. Do they have that? I thought, I thought Naughty Dog was independent. They are, well, they're technically an independent company. Right. But I mean, they do all their work for Sony right, right now. But I, I thought if they wanted to do something else, they could. No. Well, I guess it depends. That's a good, that's a good question, actually, because obviously Sony owns the IP yeah, like they couldn't do a, their own Uncharted game, but like, right. but I was under the impression, and I might be wrong, I don't know Naughty Dog's corporate structure, but I was under the impression that if Naughty Dog wanted to work on something like multi-platform, they could. I'm not 100% certain about that, to be honest with you. I wonder if anyone in the chat room knows more about that than know. we do. I guess some people I could call that would probably know, but I don't know if they tell us <laughs> on the Yeah, air. they wouldn't tell us, and we couldn't use their names <laughs> yeah. anyway, so. Um, but it's like... Uh, so, but here's yeah. the thing. So they if go they to could. they go to Sony and they say, "Hey, we just <laughs> talked to Gaben, and we're gonna make Half Life 3. And you know what Sony's gonna do? Sony's Round gonna them. no, they're gonna say, "Here's all the money. Here's, yeah, here's anything you need. Put it on PlayStation 4." Well, no, no. I think they would First. shove as much money at them as possible to make them not make the game. Because, oh, you think? Yeah, because Half Life 3, you can't just put it out on PlayStation. I don't think it has True. to at least come out on PC. And it, look, it kind of has to come out on Xbox. And so I feel like if Sony got wind of the fact that they were going to make this Half-Life 3 game, they would just put so much money in Naughty Dog's pockets and be like, no, 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 Uncharted 5, bro. Like, <laughs> you think they're going to make another Uncharted? Probably. I don't know. One thing I will say about Naughty Dog is that they, I do respect the way they run their business. And mm -hmm. they're smart, and I feel like they will know when it's time to end something. But... Well, I get, a lot of it will have to do with how well it's the next one sells. Well, I, I think Uncharted's over after four. I think, you know, and then we're going to see more Last of Us, and then I think we're going to see new stuff. Well, that leaked this week. They did a live stream this week, and someone from Naughty Dog said, let it slip in the first The Last of Us. Well, duh. I mean, didn't Nolan North already say something like that? Yeah, I mean, there's been a couple little or leaks here somebody, and there. Somebody said something about Last of Us, too. I mean, it's like, it's one of the worst kept... You know, it's not really a secret, I guess, in the sense that, like, you know, it's, you know but well, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's like you'd be an idiot to not make another one, basically. But like, I think you know, I I think Uncharted is more of the like, you know, there's kind of a new regime at Naughty Dog now that Amy Hennig left, and and you know, uh, you know, Last of Us is sort of a, a breath of fresh air for them, and I think I think you know, they're calling it a thief's end for no for a yeah. good reason. I think they're gonna you know, kind of move on from that. 
uh, that was that's sort of the this is the PS3 era Naughty Dog, and now they're going to move on to the Last of Us era, and probably a new, I would think a new IP would be in the in the works. But maybe so Console Eyes in our chat is saying that Sony owns Naughty Dog. I don't think they own Naughty Dog. I'm not 100 percent certain. That's why I asked. But Console Eyes seems to think that they do. So. If they do own Naughty Dog. Uh, I'd like to know when that happened. And if they do a Naughty Dog, Half-Life 3 is never happening. <laughs> well, yeah. Which makes you wonder why they would, would even say that. Right, yeah. So. I would, you know what, going back to your one of your original statements, though, saying that, you know, who would you rather have develop Half-Life 3, and if it's not Valve, you're right, it probably would be Naughty Dog. Yeah. I mean, I mean Half-Life, you know, first person or not, uh, Half-Life is defined by its cinematic pedigree and it is, there's yeah. no one else who does that better than Naughty Dog right now. So I mean, is there a better developer than Naughty Dog right now? Uh, there might be developers who are better or, or coming up with more interesting or innovative ideas, but in terms of like that, you know, the detail and the and the presentation and just sort of that the cinematic feel and sort of that attention to you know, emotion and and everything. You know, the, all, we talked about like all. There's more detail in that one 15 minute demo than in most games combined. Yeah, you know? and like, and I mean, they have the best programmers. In best my programmers. Opinion, period. Like that's, best, that just goes completely without environmental any artists. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, like and and I think you know game you know performance capture. Like they. I think maybe their weak beyond. their weak spot is design because their designs are kind of generic and. A little bit. Well, I mean, I, my weak spot for me would be, you know, and I love Unch- I love the Uncharted's. I like Last of Us, but I felt I felt like Last of Us, you know, the gameplay was all stuff I'd done before. Yeah. And in some cases, better. I mean, Uncharted's and, kind of that way too. Yeah. That's why I'm saying their designers are they're not that they're deficient, but that's the one place where maybe they're not the best. Right. But it's like uh, I don't know, like a like a like a Marvel movie. You know, it's like yeah, maybe they're not the most original films of all time, but I have a great time. At, at that, right. like that, I have a great time playing Uncharted. I have yeah. a great time playing Last of Us, and um, even if, you know, in terms of like kind of catching you up in that world and sort of pulling you into the game and and just sort of giving you an experience that doesn't that no one else really matches. I think Naughty Dog is on top of that heap for sure. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, look at that that demo is insane. That's why. I, what what would they do with Half Life Three, man? Yeah, <laughs> it would be exactly. amazing. I would and, love to see it. Yeah, and you like. And then, but then, like you get in the whole things, like, do you do you really want to know what that what the weird guy in Half Life is and yeah. where he comes from and who? You, do you want explanations for those things? Do you? Well, you don't necessarily have to explain that stuff in the third game. I mean, yeah. you can just send it off on some other tangent. Like, I just love that universe and the vibe of it, and you know, I obviously I love the innovation that the series has always brought to mm-hmm. the table. Like, whether you talk about the first game and its cinematic presentation, or you talk about the second game with the gravity gun and the physics built into the gameplay, like so that's but that's why I wonder about like you know a third Half Life. See, a third Half Life happens under the under the auspices of Naughty Dog. Like it can't just be, you know, Last of Us with Combine. Right. You know, like it has to be something. You can't just be Uncharted with. You know, no wisecracking. <laughs> David can come down to LA for six months, put his stamp on it, let Naughty Dog do all the heavy lifting, and off we go. Yeah, and that's why I want. You know, have there ever has there ever been a lot of like you know behind the scenes sort of like discussion on like you know who who invented the gravity gun right. over there? Who yeah. who came up with that? Who implemented it? Well, know? I remember I was at E3 one year when they showed Half Life Two for the first time, and I remember it was me and like five people in a room with Gavin, and he sat up there at a lectern with a mouse on his lectern and showed us all that stuff for the first time. Mm-hmm. And I will say that my impression that I got from that demo that day was that it was all his baby. Like you can yeah. I mean you can tell when you're talking to somebody about something whether they have ownership over it. Mm-hmm. And the vibe I got was that this was his baby and this was all his I mean all right. he I'll say one thing he knew it inside out upside down. So. That's how I felt when uh, I'm a, a couple of GDCs I remember uh, I had demos like that of the new Unreal stuff from Cliff Cliff Blazinski and yeah. uh, which you know, obviously that would turn out to be Gears of War. Yeah. But at the time, it's like, oh, this you know that this, that whole thing where it's like, this is just stuff we made to demonstrate. It's, it's not an actual game, right? It's just, you know, like, mm-hmm. And then yeah. it was. But yeah. like, you could do the same thing where it was just like, you know, it, it, he, they said it was just like a demo to show what the engine could do, but like this meant something yeah. to them. And and Cliff was very, you know, clearly this was something that was close to uh, 
what he wanted to do like for the future. And then, of course, I remember looking at that and just like, yeah, great, bump mapping's great. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Nothing will ever actually look like that. And then Gears of War comes like, oh. Okay, I, I, guess, yeah. I guess it will look like that. All right. It actually blows my mind to think back to the fact that I was in the room when Half-Life 2 was first demoed. Yeah. Like, you don't see Gabe anywhere anymore. Like That's true. I mean, you'll not never get him in a situation like that again. Not like, since not since the stage of the Sony press conference that year. It's kind and of, that was what four or five years yeah. ago now. Like he just doesn't come still out anymore. Still a shock. Anymore. Still yeah, some, still, <laughs> still a shock that shows up on those like top five craziest moments of E3. Yeah, he actually walked on stage for a press conference. Yeah, I don't know how they convinced him to do At that. Sony. Yeah, I yeah. know who he had bad mouth the yeah. whole time. So anyway, I think we're both. We will always hold hope. Forever for Half Life yeah. Three, and if this would be a great happen. marriage. Exactly. If Shenmue <laughs> Three can happen, a game that doesn't have an iota of the interest of Half Life Three, Half Life Three can happen. Yeah. So, but I think Naughty Dog's on the right track here. Like Valve's probably not going to do it. It's going to take yeah. somebody stepping in to say, "We have the bandwidth, we have the technical know-how, <laughs> we can do it. Come down, hang out with us for a few months, tell us what your vision is for it, and we'll make it happen. And the rest we'll do through conference calls and yeah. video calls." So, yeah. I I think yeah. Hope and pray, sifters. Make it happen. Yeah, let's go, Naughty Dog, go, Gaben. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one other game that we're going to pull out of TGS to talk about on its own is okay. So Sony's having us. Did you watch the press conference live by any chance? No. It started at like midnight. <laughs> and it's very weird too. Like they had their press conference like two Time days before the show started, and so it started at midnight. And I was up because I was like, "All right, I'm going to help with the curation for Sifted because you know we could get an avalanche." What I really thought was, "I'll work for an hour and go to bed." Dude, I was up till five in the morning because that press mm. conference was so loaded with stuff. And one of the things it was loaded with was a trailer for a new Resident Evil game, and so. They start talking about Resident Evil. They're talking about, oh, it's like the 20th anniversary, and you know we need to have something to commemorate it. I'm starting to get all excited and pumped up. I'm like, oh my god, they're going to show Resident Evil 7. And this is a perfect place for it. They're in Japan. Mm -hmm. It's Sony's press conference. Resident Evil was birthed 20 years ago on the play. It was just everything was perfect for the debut of Resident Evil 7. And what do we get? Umbrella Core. A first-person <laughs> shooter. Dude. Hmm. This is, haven't we haven't we been here before? Also, I mean those old, those terrible first person shooter versions, you know, first person right. Resident Evils on the PS One. So there, you, there's your anniversary tie-in. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. Remember this horrible mistake we made on that <laughs> old system? Yeah, let's do it again. Yeah, twenty years later, yeah. let's commemorate that god awful decision we made. What was that called? What were those called? Uh, I don't even remember. You remember what I'm talking? Yeah, there was like, one, I was like two about. of them, and yeah. like they were, yeah, like Survivor or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. Yeah, they were not good games no. by any stretch of the imagination. No. So anyway, here we have what basically it looks like they've turned mercenaries into an entire game. Mm -hmm. A game all into its own, which they've actually kind of done already. Because yeah. there's already Resident Evil mercenaries. And so... Oh, wow, I don't care. Yeah, I just <laughs> don't care. It looks so generic. What it actually looks like is like the last Dead Space. Yeah. That's what it reminds me of. Because... Apparently, it's you against another team, and then the zombies are just kind of thrown into the mix to become this, like, nuisance. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not actually, like, and a Resident Evil game. A lot of these guys seem to have stolen Lara Croft's uh, mountain climbing gear. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, what do they, what do they call that? The like, de-brainer, or the no-brainer, or the brainer? Yeah, the brainer. The brainer. There yeah. It is. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um... I don't know. I, I kind of checked out of Resident Evil a while ago. Really? Um... Yeah, I didn't... I love 4. 4 is one of my favorite games of all time. Agreed. Uh, 5 is... Maybe, 4 may be my favorite modern game of all time. It's way up there. It's And it still works. It still Oh, yeah. It's up. still great. Yeah. 5 was, let's say, one close to the opposite of that for me. Didn't enjoy, And 6, I just didn't... 6 wasn't Resident Evil anymore. To yeah, me. I'd agree with that. I still enjoyed Resident Evil 6, but it was not a Resident Evil game. Yeah, it was it was just, you know, it's not a bad game, but it's not Resident Evil. It was just an action adventure yeah. with some scary elements to it. Yeah, yeah I agree. And a lot of Resident really Evil 4 weird was the quick last time game. decisions. Yeah, Resident Evil 4 was the last game in the series that actually felt like a Resident Evil to me. Yeah. Cuz 5 started stepping that direction. Mm -hmm. It had a little bit of creepiness to it. And then six was just like later. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye bye. We're just gonna make God of War yeah. with, with 
Resident Evil characters. And the funny part too is how they kept uh, pumping up like the Leon sections of that game. You know, yeah. the, the Leon sections are like the throwback sections that are just <laughs> like the old games. Yeah. Leon can't punch a boulder into shattered <laughs> debris with a press of the X button. It's like, oh, oh good, great. Yeah, I mean, look, and they've gone. They keep. They will not listen to fans, Matt. No. They won't do it. Like it's Capcom. They keep going the other direction. Like it's Capcom. Look, as soon as RE5 came out, like, the battle cry was out there. The fans were like, no, 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 no. You're, whoa, 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 you're whoa, whoa, headed whoa, whoa. the wrong direction here. And look, yeah. there, we, you still got one foot back in what I like, so why don't you just take that other foot and drag it back mm. over the line for <laughs> RE6? And they said they were listening. They're like, oh, okay, we w we'll do that. And we were doing that for Resident Evil 6. And then we all played it and realized that they had actually mm, nope. just kept going. In the other Maybe they are clueless as to what... Fans really want like, but then you see they're make they're remaking like Resident Evil Zero, and they and just two. did the mm. HD remake and Resident Evil Two, and maybe so that's they think those are going to be the bones for the fans. Whereas like they, I mean, the only thing I can think when I see things like Six and and Umbrella Core is like, well, you're trying to capture some kind of like weird Call of Duty style audience that like. We'll play Call of Duty we'll instead. Pl yeah, exactly. It's like, well, they don't want to play Call of Duty, but they want to play something like Call of Duty, but they want it to have zombies, but they don't want it to be like in the Call of Duty zombies. And they want to... It's like, I feel like Treyarch already beat you to this in about four different ways. So why... why? I mean, not even why are you going to waste our time. Like, why are you going to waste the money? on doing? You know, does this look like... Does that? Look oh, I like think they'll make money off this game. You think? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure they have it planned out to like... A lot of people like Mercenaries. Like, you know, yeah. that started as, like, a little side, like, extra thing, and then it got its own game, but and the, the game that was its own game was terrible, by the way, which might be a mm. precursor. That was, what, a, a 3DS launch game, yeah. I think it was, which was awful, and so, yeah, Capcom mm. doesn't seem to learn its lessons very what, well. Well, what did you think of the Underworld games? Underworld games. Resident Evil Underworld, the, the, the under, was it, was it? Revelations? The Revelations, the episodic ones. I thought they were great. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they actually did kind of step back and... At least the first one for 3DS, I felt like, was they had hit the perfect medium there. Mm. Obviously, the platform held it back a little bit technically, but as far as, like, the the vibe of the game and the design and the way it flowed, like, I felt like they had kind of hit a sweet spot there, but I don't uh, know, maybe, man. Maybe they're just trying to, I guess, I don't know, maybe they're just trying to diversify the brand and, like, you know... If you've got this many remakes of uh, or HD updates of remakes of the old games, maybe they feel they're kind of covered in that regard, so they can kind of go off in this more multiplayer action-oriented direction. But I think you know, I think the disappointment comes from the. Uh, it was like a you know, it was TGS. It was the 20th anniversary of the Toys PlayStation. It was 20th anniversary of Resident Evil, and it just would have felt nice to have that celebrated in a more tangible way. Well, here's the thing: all they're doing is remakes right now. Capcom is the worst with remakes. They're mm. re it is remaking everything and so they finally make an original game a new game and it's this yeah. it's like well so it we could got be this worse. and street fighter 5 like it could be resident evil umbrella pachinko yeah so. <laughs> well they've actually already made that for mobile phones matt <laughs> really yeah that's already already oh. available for ios and android well that's and it's your local parlor yeah so really really disappointed in this game i think we can both agree with that like i i probably won't play it I mean, I'll have to play it, I'm You'll guessing, have to at some it. point. Yeah. I don't want to play it. I'm only going to play it if you make me play it for Which the show. could be possible. Might happen. Might happen. <laughs> you may have to do the game about for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on to the next topic of the Big Six, and this is another DLC topic. So this one really burns my britches, too, man. Yeah. So it came yeah. out this week that Rockstar North is starting to reevaluate whether it will do story DLC for Grand Theft Auto V. So basically what it's saying is that Grand Theft Auto Online has done so well that it's making it reevaluate its position and second guess what they want to do story DLC for the game. Matt, how do you feel about that? That's stupid. I mean, I, as someone who loved the heist stuff and I, pl I played, you know, the heist update really made GTA, GTA Online worth playing for me. And I'd probably put 100 plus hours into that thing. But I love Battle of Gay Tony, and I loved, I thought The um, uh, Lost and Damned was like, because like, you know, I like GTA 4 a lot, but like I felt that the story really kind of was, it was very somber, and it had a lot of trouble connecting its narrative to the, you know, I don't want to say ludonarrative dissonance, but I want to say yeah. like, you know, 
uh, it didn't quite match up. The character didn't quite match up with what you were doing as a, as a general Grand Theft Auto game. But I thought Lost and Damned and Balagay Tony really brought the fun and the crazy back. The other thing I thought and, those, those... And I like GTA V's characters. Yeah. I'd like to see more of, of some of that and like more of that world and more of what's I happening. I like GTA V's characters way better yeah. than GTA IV's. Like, I didn't really connect with most of the, I did. I still love the game, but I didn't connect with the characters in GTA IV the way I did with GTA V. Mm-hmm. And the other thing I love about Story DLC for Grand Theft Auto games is that it forces you to kind of experience parts of the game that maybe you skimmed over or didn't really experience when you played through it on your own. Like... Uh, Lost in the Dam was all about motorcycles. And I had never really driven motorcycles Mm -hmm. that much when I played it on my own. And suddenly I'm forced to kind of experience this part of the game. And I found out it was great. And I really liked it. It also helps you explore some of the side characters in the game. Like, there's lots of characters in Grand Theft Auto V. You're like, that's a really cool character. But you see them until they get killed. Or you do the three missions with them and then they're gone. And, like, this allows the game to expand on these characters and help you get to know them a little better. And Mm -hmm. maybe they meet a tragic end, which they often do in Grand Theft Auto games. But... It builds up your your feelings for that character before that occurs. So, mm. I think this is a huge mistake. I think it's also leaving a ton of money on the table that they could be making off of this. Yeah, I would agree. It's not. I mean, GTA never needed online before to, yeah. to you know to be one of the biggest games of all time. And like, I I mean, I really enjoy the online stuff, but like, I will play a, a story expansion GTA, of GTA any day above another online because it's like the online stuff hasn't really been see I'll be honest with you I have not played Grand Theft Auto online hardly at all like I played it I know lots of people get really into it and have played the living tar out of it but I played it for like a week after it came out and like everyone on there was just so mean oh yeah but like the heist toxic but like, I, I mean I, I did the same thing but then when the heist update came out some friends and I, and I online like went and we did all the heist stuff and we I mean that stuff I can is see a, if you have a, a group ton of friends of fun. yeah I mean, because it's separate from like the you know the roving bands of crazy jerks right. like on, you know because that's pretty much what G- and also now you can you can like go into a mode where they can't kill you and so you can kind of get your stuff done, um, but like you know so the, the the heist stuff is very story driven and so like there's at least something being told there and you have some ownership of your character and the heist missions are really interesting and really well designed. Far beyond almost anything else, anything in the story of GTA V. I think the heist mission, the heists are just awesome online. But like if you ain't gonna add more of those, uh Well now the new thing is like get... the whole free mode thing. We we're just showing the trailer for it right. there where they just kind of toss stuff at you as the game is happening. Yeah, like, it's not interesting. And like yeah, I know they put the no editor narrative out, like behind like, it. But I'd rather see you know, they've got such a compelling idea happening with the way they've structured the, the offline story and you've got the three characters that you can switch between at all times and get these different perspectives on the city and all that, I think there's just there's somewhere you can go with that with a, another set of three characters, or you add one more character to that three character mix, or whatever. Like, you know, give me some, you know, give me something more. Give me, you know, because I don't know. I, I I I wonder if maybe they're just sick of, you know, having to kind of write the same satire over and over again. Well, that would just mean that they can't make any more Grand Theft Auto games, though. I mean, if you're going mm-hmm. down that road, that means they're not, and you know, they're going to make more Grand Theft maybe, Auto. Maybe, so. you know, what if their plan is like, what if they just want to expand GTA Online from now? on? Maybe like that would be disgusting. Maybe the next, maybe the next GTA game is just going to be like, oh, it's just it's San Fierro and and uh, Las Venturas, and we're going to add it on to the existing GTA Online. So now it's like basically San Andreas Online. I don't think people would go for that. I, think I that don't would think be so. A huge I don't think mistake. so either. But do you, I, I think do you think Rockstar might be thinking that? No, I don't think they'd be that stupid, man. Because you you can't. Well, you can put a price on a sixty dollar game and selling twenty million of those sixty dollar games, mm-hmm. like. One thing I've realized recently, you know, just working with Sifted is that, like, you know, there's a big difference between getting a basic subscriber and a premium subscriber. Like, the premium subscribers make the difference. Like, Mm -hmm. and it's the same thing with this. It's like selling a $60 game times 20 million versus selling a dollar to uh, this guy here, a dollar to that guy there. Like, there's a big difference between that. Like, you need long, sustained success at a dollar a piece to really create that mountain of money that they generate every time with a Grand Theft Auto. Like, I just... I don't think they'd ever do it, man. I guess it depends, and we don't know this, but I guess it depends how many of those 50 to to $100 uh, bank cards they've sold on as uh, oh, yeah. uh, the add-on <laughs> DLC <laughs> for right. the GTA Online. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm sure they're looking at DLC and doing the math and saying, mm. well, we can put this team of 30 guys on 
adding something to Grand Theft Auto Online. I mean, I would buy a, a GTA Five equivalent of like Ballad of Gay Tony or Lost and Damned sure, without sure. thinking yeah, twice. Yeah. But like, I don't know. You know Math wise, it may not work. Maybe DLC and just adding to Grand Theft Auto Online does make more sense financially than mm. building story DLC, and I can get that. But at a certain point, you also have to look at like the greed and be like, okay, like this is what our fans want. And even though we may not make quite as much money doing this story DLC versus just creating a new hat for our own life, yeah. <laughs> sometimes you gotta like give back a little bit to like the people who support you. And I feel like Rockstar is typically pretty good about that. So I don't know. I'm mm-hmm. really hoping they do story. I love the characters in this game. I want to play more with the characters, but I played online for a week after I finished the campaign. I never went back to it. I don't see myself ever going back mm-hmm. to it. I can see the heist being fun, but like it's really hard for me to get people together to play games that online. That is key because I like, mean, I've been through all I think I think if I if I grind out like another like 20 levels, I'll have a platinum on that game. Wow. And like cuz we did everything. Yeah. But we did everything cuz we were a group of four people who right. like played together and I have, you and know, you so were all I've, good at it. Yeah, yeah, and I played everything all together. All the all the heists, all the different permutations, all the different jobs, the whole deal. But um, I have never, in all the hours I've played, completed a heist with a random pickup group. Yeah, it's it impossible. Just, it just There's can't be done. There's too much coordination. Yeah. yeah. And so that's the, my perspective. And then you know, just getting thrown out into Grand Theft Auto Online is just not fun. Like, no. just having people constantly murdering you. Like, well, now that I can summon in an armed like Apache gunship, it's more fun because <laughs> um, you do make a lot of money from the heist. And someone so. starts messing with you, and you just zap in your helicopter. Yeah, so now, so now I just go get in my helicopter, fly back over, and blow them up. I mean, that's that's. Yeah. It, and and of course the best part of, of the I'm random, nowhere near a place being able to no, afford something. But the like best that. part of that is like how it just continually escalates and then you just get people flying in, in like jets and right, stuff. And, right. and, and like what started is like someone ran up and punched you in the back of the head, like culminates like twenty minutes later in, 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 in yeah, in like a, a F F eighteen dog fight or right, something. You know, yeah. and, like, and so that's that's pretty fun. Yeah. It's it's stupid and it's pointless and it's not the level of thing. That I get out of like the storied stuff, yeah. But it is fun. It is, yeah. I mean, um, that's why a sandbox always is. Fun. Um, I would, I mean, I would like to see them go back to like a period piece, like an '80s thing or '70s thing. Um, I would not like to see Liberty City comes back, come back, because I think that's kind of a boring area, especially after it's been done. Especially yeah. after Los Angeles. I mean, it's, it's such a more interesting place to yeah to play and. Um, I don't know. In the end, I think I'd rather have Red Dead Redemption too. I think a lot of people would say that, <laughs> especially because of how long they've dragged out Grand Theft Auto Five already. Yeah, I can't believe how long ago that game still came out, and we're talking about it on Game Face right now. Yep. Like, still talking about it. It's still relevant. They're still putting out trailers for it. It's, it's got legs. It's insane. It knows no how game to use has legs them. like that one, apparently, except for Call of Duty, maybe. And even those after Counter-Strike. a year, Counter Strike. Yeah. Team Fortress Two. Yeah. Hearthstone will probably have it. Just list a bunch of Valve games. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to the last topic of the big six. So, in the last week, it has been the 20th anniversary of the PlayStation, mm. the 20th anniversary of Resident Evil, which we just said, yep. the 30th anniversary of Super Mario Brothers. Yeah. And so, we're getting a little nostalgic here on Game Face, mm-hmm. and we're going to talk about our very earliest PlayStation 1 memories. So... I'm just going to start in general talking about the PlayStation because one thing I would say about the original PlayStation, I had been a gamer for a really long time, and it was like this new thing. It was like this, and like it was from this new company, and like we were really like dicey about it, and nobody that I knew really wanted to get one, and so my buddy, I was living in Philadelphia at the time, and I was like really into like the house and club scene and raving and all that sort of stuff, and my buddy had like a weekly event on Thursdays and he calls me and he's like hey he's like there's this new system coming out from Sony called the PlayStation and they just contacted me and they want to bring kiosks into like our night and have kiosks there and he was like concerned about like it would break the mood of the club and it would bring in too much light and all this and I was like well you know I don't know if it's going to be too too like good and we argued about it and finally he decided he was going to bring it in and so Sony, that Thursday night, brought in all their kiosks, and nobody touched them. <laughs> like, they literally sat there all night. With no, and there was, like, a Sony rep who just sat there kind of sad all night. And like, mm. no, and, like, they were too bright, and it did totally, like, ruin the vibe of, like, my friend's party, and he was all pissed off about it. That was my first experience with PlayStation. 
And then, <laughs> seriously. PlayStation ruined my rave. Right. And it was before, <laughs> like, the PlayStation came out. Like, right. it was, like, a month before it had come out. And they thought it was, like, all exclusive and we were going to be all over it. And everyone at the party was just like, dude, why, are, why is this here? What is this? Yeah. Thing? I messed around with it for a little bit because I was a gamer. And what I were the games on it? I can't even remember at this point, to be honest with you. So They didn't have Wipeout. They were crazy. Yeah, they didn't have... Actually, Wipeout was not there. And yeah. that would have made perfect sense for that's, that's where, yeah, that's where you put Wipeout. Yeah, yeah. So, eventually my buddy bought one, like, on launch day. I did not buy a PlayStation on launch day. I waited, I. I waited a little while. And uh, so, we had this buddy who we would go to his house, and we would play games before we go out at night. So, we'd go to his house, we'd all meet, we'd buy, like, a case of beer and drink there... Before we went out, so we we were college students, we were poor, right. so we tried to get drunk at his place before we went out, where the drinks were like three <laughs> times more expensive, and we'd just sit there and we'd play video games, and that was where PlayStation became like a part of my life. That's how it became ingratiated to PlayStation, and so a lot of the games I'm going to talk about in this segment are games that I ended up playing those nights at my buddy's house. Mm -hmm. And so what about you? Give me your backstory on PlayStation. Um, well, I, I had a Saturn at the time, and I wasn't sure if... Uh, I wasn't sure if this whole Sony thing was going to work out, because you know, we'd already seen the 3DO kind of come and go, and you know, Atari was trying to come back with a Jaguar, and you're like, okay, well, like, I don't know. The Saturn hasn't been doing too great with this whole CD thing. So maybe, you know, and they already had the, the moment with um, you know, the first E3 where you know, Sega announced their price, and... Uh, so Sony, the Sony guy just walked up and like, you know, wait, what was it? he's like, two hundred ninety nine ninety nine, yeah, and, and, and like that, <laughs> that was hundred bucks less than the Saturn, and that was the end of that. But um, Sony learned that lesson well. Yeah, they did the same thing. Then just they here did, this they last screwed generation. themselves the same way <laughs> years later. They screwed themselves on PlayStation Three. Yeah, and, the, and then took the other tact with the PlayStation Four. But like, so I didn't get one. Uh, I was interested, but then my roommate in college at that year of college. Um, uh, was buying a whole lot of electronic stuff, and it turned out that he was uh, not buying it with the permission of his parents. So he had mommy so, and daddy's credit card. Something like that. So, <laughs> and he he left school uh, af shortly after that was discovered. But he left all the equipment in our room. So I had my own room, and I had like a PlayStation One and a 3DO, and like it was, like it was great. Yeah. Um, so we had like, and he had like a full the full set of launch games. So we played a lot of stuff like that. So so that was my first introduction to uh, the PlayStation. Was like, oh, someone just left it in my room, and so I just I'm, well, let's go, let's play this, guys. You know. So um, and like after playing it, like I think it was I think it was having to like really sit down with those launch games. Because the Saturn didn't... I, mean, I love the Saturn, and the Saturn has some of my favorite games on it, but the 3D on that on the Saturn, even for the time, Bad. was not yeah. tops. <laughs> yeah. but that like, being nice. But playing the PlayStation 1, even though you're going to see some real primitive visuals uh, here, yeah. um, it... It was what kind of made me finally believe that like a 3D console was because because you know was feasible. Yeah, yeah, PCs were going in that direction. You had kind of like the you know mm -hmm. the, the X wings and the and the wing commanders that kind of were like oh you know uh, Wolfenstein so like but consoles had been for consoles had been good. 2D and now like, this was kind of like oh maybe maybe the consoles will get there you know maybe yeah. there's 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 something here. So that was that was my earliest PlayStation. I didn't buy an, I didn't buy one for another uh, almost. A year and a half after that, and then you had to buy three of them. No, <laughs> it's standing on its side. Well, actually, yeah, I did go through three of them. Yeah, the so did I. The first one, I, the first one I got was actually one of the original ones with the, the you know the RCA plugins yeah. on the back, which I heard maybe you know more about. Was that was that really like a, a sought after thing for like music audio files or like? I've I, honestly never heard that. No. You never heard that because uh -huh. I heard that like there was a whole like it was like the best clearest whatever CD, CD player. player imaginable at the time okay. or something, and people like. Like, like DJs and people would like hunt that down. But see, and, like, DJs weren't using CDs back then. We were using vinyl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like, I, I, all I know is, I mean, I don't know anything about yeah, that. Yeah. All I know is that people were like hunting that thing down. And when I went to throw out my broken one, because my, you know, I, I did the whole, I, you know, I helped turn it upside down so it would work. And then you put it on the side, you like all that stuff. And finally, it just wouldn't work anymore. So I got another one. And when I went to throw it out, um, one of the guys down in, in the dorm. Was like, are you just, you're just getting rid of that? And I'm like, well, yeah, I don't have any. It, it doesn't work anymore. He's like, dude, I'll fix it. it was, yeah. he, was, he was like the he was like the the the, the dorm like the like music tech DJ yeah. tinkerer guy. Right. And he took it and he got it working again. I mean, it didn't play games anymore, but he could get CD audio out of it, and he used that for like 
whatever he was doing for his production stuff he yeah. was doing. So Matt, we're gonna we're both gonna go through a couple games that have bit, made big impressions on us in the early days of the PlayStation. Matt, your first game is Wild Arms, and yeah. why have you mentioned this as one of the games you want to talk about? Uh, well, odd, like Wild Arms, oddly, is one of the later PlayStation One memories, but it is the first game I bought when I bought my own PlayStation. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, because I bought it in '97 in preparation for um, uh, Final Fantasy VII. Yeah. Because it was you know. I love Final Fantasy VI, and still my favorite game in the series. And uh, well, Final Fantasy III, we thought of it then. Right. But like, I was so I was like, well, I gotta play the next one. And then I didn't end up liking it much. But like, I but I was so hyped for Final Fantasy VII that I I wanted an RPG. Like, I, and so I got Wild Arms because that was the only thing that was out. And uh, I actually really liked it, um, even though it was, it was pretty primitive at the time, like giant, big head, weird things and stuff. Uh, but I the the intro is really good. Uh, with a really cool opening theme that I still have in my uh, my MP3 rotation today. See, this intro actually looks good. There's yeah. a lot of PlayStation intros that do not still look good. No, this is this is some pretty <laughs> high quality stuff for the time. For the time, yeah. This and I don't know. I don't. I can't tell if this is the the Alter Code F version where they kind of cleaned it up a little bit. But um, and my fr- my friend uh, Miguel uh, Concepcion. Concepcion, yeah, who who you can find on Twitter as Normal Mode. We used to play this together. And like we would always watch this and make fun of it of the of the opening uh, where he's climbing up the hill at the yeah, cliff yeah. at the end, <laughs> and he kind of stops, and like yeah. all the magic things come out, and I was just like, he's inspired by bubbles, and for some reason Miguel thought that was the funniest <laughs> damn thing I'd ever said, and so forever that remains, uh, yeah, inspired by bubbles. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, so that remains a, a kind of a running gag between us is, is the inspired by bubbles thing. Yeah. But this was yeah. So this was the first RPG I played on in like a first on the PlayStation 1, and uh, I still have good memories of it. All right, so the first game I'm going to talk about is a game called Destruction Derby. And the the reason I'm going to talk about this game is because when my buddy bought that PlayStation, he bought, like, the whole launch lineup. Mm -hmm. And I went over to his house, and we were sitting around drinking beers. Like, we had a couple 40s or whatever. And we're, like, trying out this PlayStation for the first time. He had the whole library there. And... (laughs) There was nothing worth playing. Like the launch of the PlayStation, that launch lineup was awful. I mean, you're not a Battle Arena to fan. No, I was not at all. <laughs> and I think that game's completely overrated, by the way. So basically, I wrote off the PlayStation, and I was like, "Oh, screw this thing! It doesn't have anything good." I'm like, "I guess I'm gonna have to wait for like the N64." And like they were already starting to talk about the Dreamcast at that point. I was like, "I can't find anything I like on this system." So I went back over to his house, like couple weeks later or whatever he's like oh look at this game i just got he's like it's destruction derby and i was like oh and i was like (laughs) this is really simple and at the time like i thought it was like the best looking playstation one game. it was actually i have not turned towards the screen until just now and in my head i was thinking it because i i played this too when on the launch lineup that my ex-roommate got and in my head, this game looked a lot better than that. Now, this actually was not a launch game. This came out, like, like literally like a couple weeks after launch. So, okay. technically, it's not a launch game. But I was blown Window. away by this game. Like, I was like, oh, my God, the cars are getting, like, destroyed. And, like, well, there's... The only thing I remember is the AI was brutal. Oh, yeah. It was a hard game. And that was the thing. Like, we played, like, one match of this for, like... Ever <laughs> trying to win, and we we became obsessed with it. And like people would come over, and they come in and be like, they're like, "What are you playing?" I'm like, "Oh, we can't beat this." So like, I'll beat it, and then they couldn't. Be- like, nope. it would just turn into this like daisy chain of failure, basically. <laughs> All of us trying to get through like what we got it down to like one time to like two cars and us, and we were like, "Oh my god!" And our car was holding on by like a thread. Like, I don't know. Of all the, the launch period games, this game looked the best, and for whatever stupid, silly reason, this happens all the time, though. Like, if you're in college or you're playing games with a lot of friends, you find this, like, one game that everyone likes to play. Like, for a while with my friends, it was, like, Wayne Gretzky's 3D Hockey. Like, for whatever reason, <laughs> the game's not great, but it just became one of the, And I have a feeling that, like, Rocket League's a lot like that for a lot of people right now. Mm-hmm. It's one of those games that's, like, real simple that people just get hooked on. It's easy to play with others. And so that was it for me. And a so, match is over in a, a minute or yeah, so. Yeah, like, and yeah. you can pass the controller without yeah. people getting salty and be like, you're taking forever. So that was kind of that game for me at launch. And your next game is? My next game is Wipeout XL. And I think a lot of people um, might put that on Yeah, that's list. that's got to be up there. Because it, it, it was fast, it was fluid, it was, I think it was 60 frames per second, wasn't it? it, was, it well, was, you can watch here. <laughs> it, it, was it is very... 60 frames per second glory. <laughs> and... Uh, 
This is another one I played Look a lot. Look at that track drawing, by that. the way. Woo! <laughs> it's like it was, you can only see like 50 feet yeah, of the track that's, and the that's rest what, of it That's what the kids in. will never understand. Those old day, the old 3D console days when like you, you measured a console's power by the drawing the draw of the biscuits. racing games. Yeah, yeah. And like, well, I mean, I don't know. Metal Gear Solid Five has some pretty nasty pop that's in. That's true. There's a lot of modern games that have LED Look at that billboard issues. just appear out of nowhere. I can't even believe Red Bull existed back in that 1995. I thought it didn't come to the States until like the late 90s. Well, this was a very European game, remember? Yeah, and I was right. gonna say, like, And I was going to say, like, this is, I played this a lot with Miguel, and this is a kind of, and a couple other friends at the time, and this really, the soundtrack on this game was insane. Incredible, yeah. And it really kind of, spark, it helped spark, I mean, he was already into it, uh, you know, his, uh, Miguel's a very Britpop person, yeah. so we were all very He and I talk about that. music all the but, time. But, like, this together. really kind of, like, kicked off a kind of a trance obsession, yeah. like, with a lot of, like, our friend group, because... Yeah. People, we were just playing this all the time, and everyone's like, "Oh, what's that song? Like, what's that?" Yeah. Yeah. People, even people who weren't interested in the game, were like, "What's that song that's playing?" And so, like, it really became kind of a jumping-off point for like music and games and all. I mean, it, you know, not not to buy into the Sony uh, the Sony ad ad line, but it's like the PlayStation One really kind of changed our media consumption oh, habits completely. Yeah. So. Yeah, so Wipeout XL is uh, uh, definitely a big nostalgia favorite. Okay, my next pick is one that I, I'm assuming everyone probably assumed that was going to be mentioned, and it's Resident Evil. And, Resident Evil. I mean, I'm not going to spend forever talking about this, because obviously everybody yeah. knows about Resident Evil. It was just remade a couple months. I mean, that just shows you, 20 years later, a remake of this game, still relevant, still being yeah. loved, still selling really well and being one of Capcom's best sellers, by the way. <laughs> That's so sad. And uh, so, yeah, Resident Evil, just cinematically, the storytelling, the the, co- the content and the gore in the game, the realism that was involved with it, just it created the, a genre that I would end up loving for decades and decades to come. Um, I can't say enough good things about the PlayStation 1 version. I mean, it's just one of those games where you play it for the first time, you're like, wow, I never really thought video games could ever do this. And Chris is our old partner, you yeah, know. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and even all the corny dialogue, like, you didn't care because I was so blown away by, like, this, the CG. I and mean, look, mm-hmm. I totally knew it was, like, pre-rendered in just a video playing off the disc, but I didn't care. I was like, yeah, oh, my God. Also, like, it's memorable. I mean, it is. And I remember, you know, some of the moments, like, I remember the first time I was playing through by myself and the dogs jumped through the window. And, like, I remember, like, calling my buddy and being like, oh, my God, dude, I literally, like, almost peed myself. And he's like, well, I got to go get that game. And then... <laughs> He goes and gets it, and then he tells stories that it just turned into, like, this virus <laughs> mm-hmm. that spread among, like, a group of friends. And as soon, soon enough, everybody was playing Resident Evil. And so I just feel like it's one of those games that kind of laid down the template for what modern games would be. And in all honesty, I think the PlayStation 1 in general did that. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like it was the first modern console. I mean, yeah. look, just this week, Naughty Dog was like, yeah... Nathan Drake collection is going to have pre-rendered cinemas in it because it was too much work to do in real. Like we're still using this text, so mm-hmm. so many paradigms were laid down by this game, and so I just felt like I had to mention it when we're talking about our faves. So, mm-hmm. and your next one is my next one is a little out of character for me, but it was one of the games that was in kind of the the, the bunch that we got in my dorm room, uh, NFL Game Day. And look, I'm um, shocked to hear you say this because I know you don't really like sports nope. games, but knowing NFL Game Day. I totally understand why. Yeah, so like this was there, and this game almost made like my because our we had suites at my in our dorm, and it was like one shared bathroom with like a single and a double room on either side of it, and the guys from the double on the other side would come over and play, and the guy the guy from the single would come over and play, and like we started playing game day against each other, and like the competition got like so nasty and heated that we decided to have like a tournament. We did like a big tournament with like a whiteboard and the whole thing and like this was like the week before the week of finals like right before and like we all like all of us almost failed like finals because we were playing (laughs) game day until like three in the morning no it was crazy addictive man like and it was also one of those games where you could just pick it up i know look (laughs) another game that looked better in my memory yeah (laughs) look at their shoulder pads when they when they go down into their set they just look flat (laughs) but you know what a lot of people liked this game way more than madden back then and there was there was kind of like that whole argument there was like this there was madden and there was nfl quarterback club which was like a couple of yeah i know look at that which was like oh, a claims man. football game, and those were like the three big yeah. ones. But a lot of people swore by game day, and they said it was the best playing. It was never the best looking, obviously, no. but it was. But it always, was smooth. It felt. It, felt, it, it played, felt good. It played good. It felt very good to play, and so I totally, totally get that, man. Like, 
But wow, look how far we've yeah. come. But just looking, I mean, this <laughs> this this game reminds me of just like cold, rainy winter nights, like waiting to have to. You know, we, we should be studying, yeah. but we're like we're playing this damn game. You know, yeah. and that's it was, what I love about video games, man, is that they provide like these touch points in your life that it'll like they'll transport you back, and you won't just remember the game. Mm-hmm. You remember all the people that you were hanging out with then. You remember what your favorite soft drink was, yeah. like what your favorite and snack like just stuff was. where like, like like people were like running down. You know when like a big like semifinal happened, someone, someone like leaned out in the hallway and says like it's like Paul's playing Dave, you know. Yeah. And it, it was oh, like Morpheus is fighting Neo, you know. Right. It's like, it's like, yeah. And it was it was, um, it was a big deal. We had a great great time. Yep, sports games. That's one thing sports games are good for, man. They really in, engender the competition and the competitive spirit. So yeah, I totally <laughs> get you putting it on this list, even though you're not like a big sports game guy or even just a big sports guy in general. Yeah. So totally understand that. So my next pick is Tekken, and the reason I picked Tekken is because during this time in my life, like we would usually to play fighting games, we would go to arcades. Period. Right. Go and play Soul Calibur or whatever. Like. If we wanted to play fighting games, we went to an arcade, and there was a Dave & Buster's that was like a few blocks away from us, and we go have a couple beers, eat some mm-hmm. wings, and play fighting games for an afternoon or whatever. We had a Tilt and a Qzar. Yeah, we had a Qzar <laughs> as well. <laughs> Those were great, by the yeah. way. But And so anyway, when Tekken came out for the PlayStation, my same buddy who I was talking about earlier, who ended up ultimately being the best man at my wedding, he got Tekken. And once he got Tekken for the PlayStation, we never went to the arcade to play fighting games ever mm. again. Because it was the first time that there was a fighting game that looked good enough and played good enough that we did not feel like we were losing much by mm. staying at home and playing fighting games. Granted, Tekken did not look as good as the arcade fighting games at the time. No, but it played the same. It played the same, and it looked good enough to mm. where we were like, yeah, we're not going to get in the car and drive somewhere to go play good fighting games. Like, it was good enough. And so... It just turned into like just what you said, like mm. yelling and hollering, and you know certain people were established as the better players. And when those two really good players would come together, like we'd be DJing while we're playing, like you'd rip the headphones off the guy who was DJing and be like, "Yo, they're throwing down," and they'd throw the headphones down and come and watch the fights. Like I miss that about video games in general. Like that's the one thing that sucks about. Well, there's a lot of things that suck about getting older, <laughs> but that's one of the things that really sucks about getting older is that your pool of people to play video games with in person just it's like a curve. Mm-hmm. Like the older you get, the thinner that pool gets until you're really glad that Xbox Live exists because <laughs> people just don't have time to go to someone else's house just to play video games. Like it just mm-hmm. doesn't happen when you get to my age anyway. So. You know, just looking back and remembering those times when we were all together playing and saying, I got next, no, I got next. And, you know, just that whole vibe of the whole thing that was all built around Tekken for us. And so mm-hmm. that is one of those games that I felt like I wanted to mention for my PlayStation 1 memories. And then the last one that we're going to bring up, I think both of us probably would have brought up if if we had, had been asked, is Metal Gear Solid. Yeah. Um, we don't think we need to say anything about Not this too much, game, but I man. will. But I will tell you again. That was another one Miguel and I played a lot. And if you Miguel to this day, Metal Gear Nut like makes music videos out of footage he captures of yeah. Metal Gear and all that. But I remember playing it, and we would like. Um, as a matter of fact, I met uh, Cam Clark, the guy who did the voice of uh, Liquid Snake, and I had him sign a thing, sign a thing for Miguel because that was like. Like we would do the hello brother like yeah. to each other. All that was our greeting. <laughs> and the other, th- I'll give you one more running gag we used to do. Where at the very beginning, the colonel is giving like Snake the rundown, and we watched that intro so many times, but like because it was amazing yeah. at the time. And uh, he does, like, yeah. And he and he says uh, he lists all the the Foxhound guys you have to yeah. fight, and he mentions uh, Vulcan. He's like Vulcan Raven. Giant and shaven. Shaven. And, we, and I always used to say giant and shaven. And um, and that was. It was and he was. He's bald. Yeah, he was, was, I'm like, yeah, yeah. he's giant and shaven. <laughs> and then I was so upset when they did Twin Snakes uh, that they they did they re-recorded all yeah. the dialogue. And now he says giant and shaman. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, now you ruined it. They pronounce it correctly now. And basically. Snake has eyes, and it's all wrong. You know, it's, yeah. it's all wrong. The PS1. I actually just played this again. Because um, I found my old Bleem disc wow. for my Dreamcast, yeah, yeah. and I put in Metal Gear Solid, it still works, and it's still kind of like, yeah, this looks so good, so much better than, no, not no. really. Anyway. 
But, but this, this was, was the other game that, yeah. like Resident Evil, kind of laid down the template of what and this was, the future of games are going to be. And like. this was mind shreddingly good looking. It was. Like yeah, the nothing time, else yeah, yeah. looked like this then. Well, it came out like right around the same time as Ocarina of Time. And same so, day, I think. Yeah. And Ocarina so, and Half Life. So it was like a big struggle for like me and all my friends to like figure out which one we were going to play. <laughs> and like I ended up getting into like Ocarina of Time really early and then convincing one of my other friends to play it while our other three friends were playing Metal Gear. And then they were trying to convince us to stop playing Ocarina of Time to play Metal Gear. And like <laughs> it's just a great time, man. The lot yeah. For me, at least in my life, the timing for it, you know, I was young and... All my friends were really young and energetic and really into games. I mean, that's the other part of it, too, is yeah. as you get older, like, a lot of your friends stop liking games. They fall out of favor with them. They don't care about them anymore. Life takes over. Yeah. Back then, everybody I knew loved video games. Yeah. This, like, was the, this was the period where, like, you know, everybody was right out of college. Nobody had any jobs that mattered yet. We yeah. were, you know, nobody had, like, you know, a career to speak of yet, so we still kind of, like... Just wanted to play stuff to escape kind of the drudgery. And it was and okay like, to was like great. stay up and play games all night. Oh, yeah, There's no I, guild involved. Or we, my my friends and I would go over to my friend uh, Andrew's place. He was one of the only play, only people who had his own place. Yeah, and we would go over every night, like seven, eight, nine at night, and we'd be up until the sun rose. Playing. I got my car towed because we played Tony Hawk so long. Yeah, once. Yeah. I mean, it was just it was a good it was a good era. I'm sure everyone. It depends how old you are. Everyone has a different era. I'm yeah, sure. I'm sure a lot of the people watching Game Face right now are saying that's how I am right now. Yeah, <laughs> or that's how I was like mid 2000s. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sure there's like people like or. And that's yeah. what one thing I would say is if you are in that zone right now, recognize it and love, love it, it and enjoy yeah. it, man. Because look, I'm looking back on it now. It was like the golden age of gaming mm. for me, and so it, it's very awesome to think about. There will there are people who will look at the PlayStation 4 the way 20 years from now the way I am looking at the PlayStation 1 mm -hmm. and they're going to be like remember when you had to hold a controller and yeah. like <laughs> remember when Metal Gear Solid 5 looked good yeah <laughs> <laughs> so anyway that's our little walk down memory lane of the PlayStation 1 I mean I could honestly we I could do a hours and days on oh, this. Yeah, I could give but, you a dissertation on Jumping Flash. Yeah, I mean, look, we do understand a lot of you guys are, like, listening to the old fogies, like, talk about the good old days. But, look, this laid down the foundation for all the stuff that you're playing today. And so every once in a while, it's good to pay some respects to his... There's only one 20th anniversary of the PlayStation. Yeah. And the PlayStation really is a system that has brought us to where we are now. I mean, if it was only the N64... And there was no PlayStation. I often have wondered, like, what we what would have happened. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a good question. It's pretty crazy to think about. I mean, look, eventually it would have got the discs and all that. Sure, but... sure. But it would have taken longer, and it would be a it'd be a different landscape for sure. And I mean, we, what if what if Sony hadn't been around uh, to to you know compete with Microsoft? Yeah. You know, who knows? It's it changed the history of gaming forever, and so yeah. we're showing a little bit of our respect for it here. And uh, I think it has earned it. So yeah. the other thing I would say to celebrate is, uh, you know, I kept it to earlier memories for the 20th anniversary. But go on PSN and go get uh, Suikoden 2, and and relive how JRPGs used to be when yeah. they used to be structured like novels instead of anime seasons. Yeah. And uh, you know, the PS1 gave us some great, great stuff. It sure did. May she rest in peace. All the all of them <laughs> that I bought, all three of them that I bought, yeah. that I don't yeah. have anymore. But I have my my big PS3 that can still play them, I think. So. Yeah, that's what. Well, if you buy them on. Oh no, yeah, yeah. All of them are, are PS1 backwards compatible. That's yeah, right. the the launch ones, the launch units. I think I think all of them can still do PS1. I, I can't they... do PS2. Oh, PS2 okay, because got... they took the emotion engine out after the first <laughs> the wave. Emotion engine. Yeah, well, yeah, the hard. It's no right. longer hardware. Yeah, yeah. You know. I'm gonna. I am going to cry when my launch 60 gig PS3 dies because I won't be able to do the native PS2. Yeah. Retro uh, backwards compatibility. Anymore. My PS2 still works. Yeah. Yeah. I it survived all that time. It still works. Actually, I think my PS2. It's loud as hell, and it sounds like yeah. it's gonna break when I use it, but it still works. My PS2 is a debug. Yeah. Actually, from, oh, from, wow. from our old old review days. You slid that out of there somehow. No, I think I had that when I was a freelancer. Oh, got you. So uh, they just never asked for it back, I guess. There you go. All right, well, it's time for us to move on to the trailer of the week, and we have a really, really good one this week. Um, it is the intro cinematic for StarCraft II Legacy of the Void, the very last chapter in StarCraft II, and I'm really starting to wonder if... We will see another StarCraft in 10 years. Hmm. 
Like, this could be the last piece of StarCraft content that we will see for a long, long time. Well, I'm sure there'll be StarCraft heroes and Heroes of the Storm. Yeah. Or something. yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. It's probably, it's, you know, who knows if there'll be a StarCraft 3. Yeah. And this is one of Blizzard's pieces of CG that's just, like, literally mind-blowing. Like, the technical part of it and the directing and the cameras and everything is incredible. So... Here you go, the opening cinematic to the final piece of DLC for StarCraft II. The swarm brought ruin to our world. Our proud people became refugees. And yet, they could not shatter our unity. For we are bound by the Kala, the sacred union of our every thought and emotion. Their CG is so good, man. Yeah, Blizzard is in their own world. They there. really are in a it's whole incredible. other league. I mean, like I, I, you know, Diablo, like I said when we were watching that, like, uh, games today still don't look as good as the Diablo 2 cinematic, nope. opening cinematic, and that was 15 years ago. How long do you think it'll take till games look as good as that? I... <laughs> Never. I, I think... Uh, clearly, games need to construct more pylons. Yeah, <laughs> because they're, they're not going to look that good anytime soon. Yeah, it's amazing. That is look, Blizz, no one does it as well as Blizzard. That's yeah. the bottom line. And the choreography, of yeah, it and the way and the flow and like you know, we we can't hear the sound here. Yeah, but yeah. you you know everything that's happening there. Oh yeah, by just by just watching, watching it because yeah. it's all so visual. And I you know there are there are those who say you know if you can tell what's happening in a TV show or whatever just by listening then they aren't using the medium right. You should be able to watch it with the sound off and, and know what's what going on. And, and right. Blizzard is always like that. Yeah. So Blizzard. kudos. I think they've, yeah. uh, they've sent their new baby out kicking and screaming in the exactly right way. I mean, their CG is just cut above. Uh, yeah. Nothing, nothing else like it. Yep. 
So it's time to talk about Tokyo Game Show. That is going to be our deep dive for this week's show. Um, we're not going to talk too much about the show in general, although we kind of we kind of did that at the open a little bit. What we're going to do is we're going to run down a bunch of games that have been unveiled and talk about each one briefly because there have been a lot. And that's mm-hmm. the one thing I would say about Sony's press conferences. I thought it was going to be nothing. And it was just like one game after another. And look, for our, our audience and for a lot of Western people, a lot of those games may not mean that much. Um, but there are a lot of games that do mean a lot. So the first one we're going to talk. The first thing we're going to talk about is the PlayStation 4 price drop in Japan. So it was about fifty bucks. About fifty bucks. Basically, what it does is it brings the price of the PlayStation 4 down to about what we're paying for it here mm-hmm. in in America. Um, so the price drop isn't that big of a deal, in all honesty. But it might help because what our TriCaster guy just put up. Is PlayStation VR. Okay. <laughs> and that was the other big announcement is that they changed the name of Project Morpheus to PlayStation VR. So I think we knew that was coming to some degree. Did you really think that was going to be the name of it? I didn't know that was going to be the name of it, but I figured it wasn't going to be Morpheus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was always kind of a project name. But I mean, that's kind of their thing now is their branding. There's like PlayStation... Whatever. Uh, PlayStation... Classics, PlayStation Now, PlayStation, you know, whatever, and so now PlayStation VR, sure. Here's what I think. I think they're just trying to avoid the whole Wii U issue, where people are like, what the hell is it? Mm, Because it's like, if it's Morpheus, people are like, well, what's Morpheus? Is it like a new game, or is it like a controller, or... It's a new new, uh, hardware add-on that lets you pretend to be Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah. (laughs) Because, look... They want to go mass market with PlayStation 4. They're actually kind of already headed in that direction anyway. And they want to be able to pick up as many casuals as they want. They know that casuals know what VR is. Yeah. Thanks to that great cover story on Time Magazine. (laughs) 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 But look, they look at it, they're like PlayStation, video game, VR, virtual. I get that. And so I understand the name. I think it's really simple and really unimaginative. But I also understand why they did it. Yeah, I mean, you got to get it across. You got to make it... Simple. And you know, even Oculus has VR in the... VR. Now it does, yeah. yeah. So I think VR is what they've settled on in the same way that at some point it was time to educate the public as to what HD meant. Yeah. So I think you're going to see the same the same thing. And I think VR will, will catch on and VR will increasingly be misused for things like when you see those, uh, those uh, ultraviolet blue wavelength glasses that make you see in HD. Right, right. <laughs> And we did get a glimpse here. You see the final, uh, it appears to be the final production unit of yeah. of Morpheus. Well, now it's PlayStation VR. But, yeah, so we hadn't really seen a, got a real good look at that until now. Look at that, a PlayStation Move. Yeah, yeah. Also interesting how they did this trailer so that you can see through the visor. They don't actually show you the visor, mm-hmm. so you can see how people react. And so the people don't look like goofballs. Yeah, I mean, it's smart. What yeah. they did with this trailer is really smart because you can see people are having fun. You can see their eyes, yeah. and and it also you still see what the headset looks like a little bit because it's got like that yeah. outline. Like you get the idea, but that, that's really smart. Whoever whoever thought of that, you I, get a raise. Yeah, I hope they get a raise. We're gonna raise for you, sir, and a little bit of stock. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you want Sony stock right now. In all honesty, because mm, you, you ride it out, I think it'll turn out okay. Sony is not all PlayStation. They make TVs and a bunch of other stuff, so. But, right. but yeah, so PlayStation VR is a big deal. And now the next thing, PlayStation 4 hard drive covers they announced at TGS. This may seem like a stupid thing. Yep. <laughs> but I don't think it is, man. No. no. Have you seen the trailer for it? No. I saw the, I saw the still picture on the Sifted site. Yeah. It was just like all the, like the multicolor. Yeah, so here's the trailer for it. I honestly think it's a genius idea. Like, being able to customize your PlayStation with colors and, like, think about the... Uh, the face plates for the 3DS, how big those have been, and how some mm. become collector's items, and like... I just don't do that. And really. face plates for Xbox 360. Remember how we used to get those sent as swag for every game? Like, they'd send yeah. you a game, and they'd send you a face plate for the I game. I still have that one we, you got when it, when they announced it. You know, they have that, like... Oh, the one at E3. Yeah, the one at E3, and they're like, here's a face plate you'll be able to put on your 360 this right. fall. And yeah. Like, oh, cool. Closet. Yeah, I think <laughs> I still have mine, too, actually. Yeah. I think it's just sitting in the closet. Those were numbered, too, man. Those might be worth money. Like, lots of money at this point. Maybe. Yeah. So anyway, it's kind of the same concept. And I'm sure like they'll start doing like game specific ones or 
Look, you can get any. You could. We can make sifted ones that we could, yeah. you know, sell to the sifted subscribers with our logo on it right, or whatever. You, so. you make one with like the the close up game face eyes <laughs> on that. I'll put, I'll put that on mine. All right. I'll, I'll, all right. I'll go with that. I think it's a really good idea. Yeah. I honestly didn't even realize that the PlayStation Four had that until I tripped over the HDMI cable and broke mine. <laughs> And then I realized you had to slide that thing off of there to put yeah. to get your hard drive out. Yeah, I knew because because you had to replace the hard drive. Yeah, I didn't even know. So, yeah. I, but anyway, I think it's a great idea. I think they'll generate money if they keep it at like ten dollars. Yeah, I mean ten dollars is good. I mean, I ten dollars is as much as I'll pay for it. Every time I rip, I pull that thing off, I feel like I'm voiding the warranty. Yeah, yeah. The thing that it doesn't me. feel like it comes off. No, I don't feel like it should come yeah. off. I felt the same way. So anyway, I think that's a great idea. Now let's start talking about some games. The first game we're going to talk about is Neo. Are you familiar with Neo? I saw the trailer on Sifted, but I didn't see, hear it with audio. Now, do you remember that this game was actually really old? No, I didn't remember that. So, at this all. game was announced like a long time ago by Team Ninja. It may have been like eight years ago. I think wow. it was like for the 360 and the PlayStation 3. And they showed, I think, one or two trailers for it, and then it just disappeared into oblivion. Hmm. And then out of nowhere, Team Ninja revives it and look, I mean, this game looks hot, dude. Like, those visuals yeah. look sick. Here's my thing, though, is like, if this game is keeping them from giving us an next Ninja Gaiden, like, then maybe I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> it looks very Ninja Gaiden, though. That's I mean. what I'm saying. Like, I feel like this is like their next Ninja Gaiden instead of, and maybe they got to the point where with the last game it turned people off that they're like, maybe we should go Just away kinda, from Ninja Gaiden for a while. Just start over and make kind of an Onimusha sort of thing. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, I don't, I mean, it doesn't have to be ninjas. Of he, course, then he looks just like the Witcher, like Geralt. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this might as well be the Witcher. Yeah, he's a prettier Geralt. Yeah, with, but... With a fairy in his sword, yeah. apparently. <laughs> oh. The game, I think, looks pretty awesome. Technically, yeah, it, looks nice. it looks solid. I mean, honestly, Team Ninja doesn't have a great track record lately. I mean, that's the one big concern. No, but this kind of looks like going back to their roots a little bit. Like, I, I have confidence in them to make a decent Ninja, Ninja Gaiden clone, especially if they've learned a few things from Ninja Gaiden 3, uh, which had a lot of bad choices. In it well, a lot of people were like, oh, it's because Itagaki left. Well, then everyone played Devil's, Devil's Third. Third. And they're and like, ah, yeah, maybe. well. <laughs> maybe he didn't have so much to do with it after all. <laughs> maybe it was just uh, a, a particular conglomeration of timing and drugs. Yeah. I don't know. I, but, uh, but, yeah, I don't know uh, what happened when Ninja got in 3, but they did fix a lot of it in yeah. Razor's Edge. So maybe, uh, you know, I'll keep my eye on this one. Yeah. I didn't realize it was announced that long ago. Yeah. It yeah, also really bothers me that eight years ago was something as recent as 2007. I know. It <laughs> really is. I think like, it was 2008 they, they showed it for the first time, okay. if I remember correctly. Don't, don't quote me on that, though. Uh, let's see, next we're going to talk about Yakuza. Yeah. So, Yakuza, they are remaking the first one mm -hmm. for PlayStation 4, and then they are also making Yakuza 6 Six. for PlayStation yeah. 4. So, really odd that they choose the first one to remake. Not really. Why? Because the first one um, uh, has never gotten like the proper facelift. Basically, like the first one is. Are we to a point where games have to get a facelift now? Is that like where we're at with video games? Well, it's interesting how like there's sort of this thing going on. I don't know how widespread it is, but there does seem to be a thing going on with like particular like game game obsessive people or like people who like really love a particular series that they want that whole series on one platform. Yeah. And. You are getting to the point where you're, you know, especially with PlayStation Now, uh, you're going to be able to play these Yakuza games like that. And, and it's weird how, like, you know, Yakuza 1 is going to be digital, Yakuza 5, US release only digital. Um, I assume if we get Yakuza 1 remake and we better, um, that's probably going to be digital only, and 6 will be digital only if it comes to America. Three still not digital, but like they're slowly sort of bringing this, this series sort of in a, into a digital format and. Uh, People love the remakes of these original classic games, and, the, and if you go back and try to play the PlayStation 2 version of Yakuza 1, uh, it's rough. Yeah, I'm sure. And the load times are just incomprehensible. And like, Do you think they need to rename these games for the West? So maybe. I mean... Because here's the thing. They're like... They're kind of like Japan's Grand Theft Auto games. Yeah. And they're barely getting released here. When they do, they don't sell gangbusters. Well, like, I of, feel like if they rebranded it a little bit... I think that, you know, it's like, you know, we think of it as Yakuza because they called it that. But, like, in Japan, it's, you know, uh, Ryuga Gotaku uh, or something like that. And it means like a dragon. Yeah. Which refers to uh, 
Kazuma Kiryu, one of the top five video game badasses of all time, uh, is you know he is like a dragon. He is, yeah. he is you know he's got the dragon tattoo. He's the whole deal. He's the real deal. Um, so I think if you kind of rebranded it into something a little more. I don't know what you'd call it. Maybe not like a dragon, but something a little more evocative. I don't know what to, I don't know what, what what direction to take that really. But I feel like Yakuza doesn't conjure what you need to conjure to make. I think most people in Amer- at least in America don't know what the hell a yakuza is. Probably like not. they don't know that it's like the mob in Japan. Like and to some a lot of people that do know that, I think you they know, probably better titled Mob in Japan. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like and also a lot of people, I think they either th- they a lot of people just think of them as like bad guys in you know kung fu movies right. or something. Or like they, it doesn't conjure the. It's not the, a part of American lexicon. No, it, does, it doesn't conjure the mystique that like the like you know the Godfather does here right. or Yakuza does in, in Japan. Japan. Yeah, you know, in Japan, it's a part of li- it's part of the culture, it's part of life. Well, yeah, when you go there, like you're like we would always have fixers, like guys yeah. who show you around the town and they translate for you when you need to, and like basically what they say is like. Never look at a guy in a suit. Yeah. Like, if you see a guy in a suit, look the other direction. Because that means they're Yakuza, and you don't want to mess with them. Because they literally, you don't know what they're going to do. Mm. And they're part of the mob, and they're protected by the police, and blah, blah, blah. But most Americans do not know that. Like, no. There's no they have no connection with it at all. And, and so, uh, yeah. renaming it might Maybe. not be the worst idea. I mean, you wonder, like, you know, Sega doesn't really seem to know what to do with this series in the West. And there is that kind of that... There is a group of very hardcore, dedicated Yakuza fans uh, in the West that you know have have you know their slow demand have started to bring things over. Uh, Yakuza Five is finally coming only through PSN, but it's like three years or something yeah. after the release in Japan. Yeah. And these the other thing is like these games are great. They are great like, games. They are yeah. great. Yeah. And like people, nobody nobody knows. Like no one knows about these things. And they also like part of the problem that I think is like they're really entertaining and they. They're advertised sort of as these like gritty sagas, and it's like they're actually kind of funny. They're goofy, a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's some goofy stuff, and like you'd never yeah. know that in there is like you know Yakuza Two includes this, this uh, mission where you have to go. You're trying to help out this like mob dude, and you think it's like you're going in for like some kind of a hit, and you go in and it's, you accidentally knock over like this fake wall, and like it's him and all his other guys are like dressed as babies with diapers. Yeah, on. yeah, yeah, and then. Well, if you te- if you say that like what they're doing is super weird, they all fight you. So you have right. to fight like ten guys dressed as babies. <laughs> There's some weird stuff like this. You trailer... punch out a tiger at one point. I mean, it's it's just well, this trailer actually hilarious. shows like a, a man like backhanding a child. <laughs> like. There's some stuff in these games that may ruffle some feathers in the West, but the West needs its feathers ruffled. Yeah, and it, so. and it definitely runs the gamut between like horrific and goofball. Yeah, you know, for every like horrible murder, there's like. You know, there's a there's a mini game in the PS3 ones where you you use your cell phone to record someone doing some crazy stunt that they accidentally do, and you learn a new fighting move from it, and it's yeah. all done like super dramatic, and it's you know, and there's stuff there like you go. that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but like, it, it's it's a shame that they haven't been able to kind of communicate better how. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I didn't remember that. You that never game. see that in a video game trailer from the West. No, never. Um, it's too bad they haven't been able to kind of communicate like how cool this series is and how interesting it's, you know, and this, the other thing is like it's a one-to-one re- you know, the Yakuza 1 one at least was a one-to-one recreation of like the Red Light District in, uh, in Shinju- Shinjuku yep. uh, where we used to stay very close yeah, to that yeah. and like I remember going there and at one point we were out there one night I'm like I know this area I, I know, <laughs> Cause you I there's Yakuza. a bar on the corner <laughs> I've been playing 70 hours of Yakuza I know exactly where we are and, yeah. we, and it's like and it's a, you know, for an American audience, I think it would be a cool, uh, you know, kind of a window into this other culture. And uh, I play I play one of the Yakuza games when it rains here. Because it, it doesn't rain in, in L.A. much, but it, when it rains, that like warm tropical rain like it did this week, yeah. I'll open the, the balcony door and I'll put on like Yakuza 3 and it, I'll be in Japan. I'll be back in there Japan. It reminds me of that so much. All right, um, let's move on. We've it. been talking too long about Yakuza. Taukiden 2, another game that was just announced. I'm surprised this one got a sequel. I am shocked that this game got a yeah. sequel. I can't believe they gave this game a sequel. Like, the like Koei Tecmo, they made some questionable decisions, I feel like. No Ninja Gaiden. They revived... Most of their decisions do involve uh, adding a, a number to something. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the other thing is, I wonder, you know, because I know there's like an open world on this one more than the, the level based of the last thing. You know, and everything's got to be some kind of pedigree of Monster Hunter now right. in Japan. But I wonder if some of the uh, some of this is like the popularity of uh, Attack on Titan. 
It could if be. some of that is pushing them back, hey, this is a lot like Attack on Titan if you idiots would pay attention to it. Yeah. Like, well, they're, I mean, they're pretty much... Koei Tecmo is also working on an Attack on Titan right, game, so... Right. <laughs> but a lot of people have theorized that, like, the Tokiden gameplay style is what they're going to kind of cannibalize to make that. It makes sense. But, yeah, I mean, the first game was... Mar- I don't even know if you could call it successful. Just... No, I don't... It was marginally marginal. It just seems... I guess it, <laughs> some, someone in Tec- Koei Tecmo just must really think there's promise here. It's still hard for me to say Koei Tecmo first, just like it's hard to say Bandai Namco. Yeah. It's like, because you've been trained to say it in the yeah, reverse the order forever. So, yeah, I'm not sure what they're thinking there. I mean, I will say that this teaser trailer looks pretty awesome. Yeah, it looks Like, cool. if you had never played or heard of the first Talkin, you could watch that and be like, I might be into that. Yeah, I'll cut an arm off a giant guy. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, Gravity Rush, a big story yeah. for Sony at the press conference. They are... Remaking Gravity Rush, which was originally a Vita game, they are remastering that for PlayStation 4, and then Gravity Rush 2, which is what you're seeing right now, is only for PlayStation 4. So they've taken the the Vita's best game away from it, (laughs) and they're not giving anything back. So have you played Gravity Rush? I played the Gravity Rush on uh, Vita. I played the Gravity Rush. The Gravity Rush. Rush. Are you a fan of the Pikachu? I am a fan um, of the Pikachu. No, I played it on, on Vita. It's really, I really liked it. I'm glad. I really I, I really liked it, but I also feel like there's this camp of people that like that wave too much. Like, Oh, yeah. I mean, I, it, I put it in kind of the same category as Mirror's Edge yeah. in that regard. Yeah, it's you're like, right. That's, yeah, a, that's super a good cool. analogy. Yeah. <laughs> but it's super cool, and I like the aesthetic, and I like the idea, and it felt different, but like, let's not go crazy. You know? Yeah. Like, but I'm really glad they're going to update it for the PS4 and a wider audience will get to experience it. And the sequels, I I mean, I kind of hoped for a PS4 update, but I yeah. never thought there'd be a sequel. A sequel, I know. I mean, Vita, first of all, you know, it probably sold, at least in the U.S., it probably sold 100,000 copies yeah. or something like that. Like, I don't even know if they've even confirmed that it's coming to the West yet, to be honest. Mm. I, most stuff Sony does like that. It does, does end up making it, it, but yeah, I it might mean, be digital only. But this Gravity Rush Two, it looks like a huge budget game. Like yeah. it's not just some little thing they slap together. Like you can tell they've been working on this game for a long time. I love the look of it. Yeah, pleasant yeah. Uh, Jet Set Radio look to it combined. You know, it also looks like the original. Yeah. But uh, it's, you know, the power of the PS4 really does it better justice. I well, think. the one thing I would say, too, is that, like, the, the whole, like, 360-degree flying thing, like, I felt like that was made for the Vita. Because yeah. you've got that screen, the beautiful screen, beautiful at least in screen, the launch version of it. screen on the back. And, and it's, yeah. like, right up in your face. And, like, I would actually get a little disoriented playing that game on my Vita. Now it's on a console. I don't know. Just watching the trailer, I don't get that same sensation of, like, flipping through the air mm. like I did well, on the handheld. Maybe you will when you strap your PlayStation VR. Now, there you go. <laughs> it could and, be. Uh, but I think both of us will agree we're excited for this game. Like yeah. we both like the original. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see what they can do now that they have even more power at their disposal to do more. Um, the game, based on the trailer and the footage they've shown so far, is looking pretty hot. It's still got the whole 360 degree flying thing going on. It's got floating islands in the sky. Yeah, it's another. I mean, just Sony making dreams come true in 2015. Yeah, you know, they're, they're they're giving. They just know, keep it coming. Giving people what they want, whether it's super popular or not. Yep. Uh, speaking of something that's probably not super popular, 13 Sentinels, which is the new game from Vanillaware. Yeah, I love, I like Vanillaware a lot. Who doesn't like Vanillaware? Yeah. Well, I'm sure there are people right now watching this saying, I don't care about Vanillaware. Oh, I hate Vanillaware. <laughs> <laughs> One thing you can't deny about Vanillaware is their games are gorgeous. Yeah, their and, art styles. And, and I'm glad to see them kind of take this more... Uh, you know, real world art style somewhere, as opposed to kind of the crazy Dragon's Crown. Uh, but this still has a really cool flavor to oh, it. Oh, it's man. got a like, great watercolor kind of look to it, and like, and the fact that they you're looking at this and you think, like, oh, maybe it's like a like a school coming of age story. Right, like, right. No, giant robots fighting <laughs> each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's cool to see them kind of go this because they're so fantasy oriented normally. Yeah, but, it's weird to see them just draw a human like a human for once. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, it's got the whole mech element to it. Uh, really excited about this game, but we're already getting near the bottom of the list. This is one of the the last ones, and the last one we're going to talk about is King of Fighters 14, or the King of Fighters. The 14. King of Fighters <laughs> 14. Yes, 14. 14. Been doing these a while. So let's see. There's romance. There's Final Fantasy. There's romance of the three kingdoms. What mm-hmm. other franchises can we think of that have got to like the 14? Actually, Romance 14? of the Three Kingdoms just announced 13 at TGS, so... I don't know if there's... 
there's got to be some, but I mean, stuff that doesn't get numbered. I mean, if you if you, it'd be like Mario fourteen. Mario, Mega Man, Resident Evil, all the things that Resident Evil wouldn't get. Well, there have been more than fourteen Resident yeah, Evil. Yeah, there games. have. Yeah, there have been a lot of Resident yeah, yeah. Evil games. Zelda um, maybe the fourteen. Zelda's probably up to fourteen. I mean, yeah, but uh, things that actually get numbers not very common. And remember, King of Fighters started as uh, with years. And then, I, and at some point, I think they were counting the art of fighting games as King of right. the original King of Fighters. Tournaments. Yeah, it all starts to get a little like mixed yeah. together. Like SNK has such a complex storyline, and some of the King of Fighters were just dreams. Right. Yeah. Like they were just like a dream match because all these <laughs> certain characters were dead, but we want to put them in, so it's just it's just an imaginary. Game. Yeah, this I'm game like, doesn't really. This exist. game didn't really happen. You never played it. <laughs> Are you excited about another King of Fighters? Mm. Well, here's the thing: it's 3D. Yeah. And my favorite King of Fighters games are the 2D games. And I honestly think most fans feel the same way. Like, I don't feel like this series has really resonated since it went 3D. Yeah, and I, I mean... And here's the thing, too. It's like, it's not just the visuals. It's the fighting engine. Yeah. It's like, I'm okay with polygonal visuals as long as it's still in that 2D plane, but it's not. Like, there's actual, like, depth to the combat in this game. And yeah, so, and like... I see where they're kind of going with it because the original, you know, the original Fatal Fury like had the the three t- levels of, of stepping, depth yeah, yeah, to jump into the screen. But yeah. like, I don't know. I mean, one also one of my things for uh, for the SNK games is like I love their art style, and that doesn't really seem to be capturing it all that well. As opposed to like something like Blaze Blue, which just took the two D animation and like put it in a three D engine and just it's flawless like yeah. that. So I don't know. Like I, I like the last couple, like which were like three D, but like two D, two D plane, but three D graphics. Yeah. Um, but I'm not really, I'm not really feeling this one so much. But you know, I'll wait until I play it. Yep. So that is going to wrap up this episode of Game Face. If you have any questions for Matt and I, feel free to reach out with them right now in the chat. Um, let's take a look at the roadmap over the next week or so. What do we have coming out next week, Matt? Next week, Pro Evolution Soccer came out. Yeah, I don't think I don't. Yesterday, know if... FIFA does FIFA come out next week? Yeah, I think FIFA's next. That's the big one next week. NHL came out this week. Um, Forza came For- out Forza this week. Forza came out yesterday. Um, um, and then there's man, I just looked at the schedule the other day to see what I needed to remember to buy. Yeah, I should know too because I need to assign stuff to people. <laughs> <laughs> but. I'm I'm just still absorbed in in uh, the games that came out like three weeks ago. Yeah, like we were saying earlier, like I'm I still haven't finished Bloodborne. I still haven't finished The Witcher. Like I'm never gonna get to those. I'm terrified. I'm not gonna finish enough uh, open world games before um, Just Cause Three comes out. Yeah, and then well, that's I'm never another gonna, one. Well, I'm yeah. not even gonna touch Mad Max. Like I've just given up on that. <laughs> I just know I'm never gonna play it. So our first question is from Thank You for Subscribing. What are you guys <laughs> looking forward to the most for the rest of 2015? Matt, I'll let you go first. Um, I'm, I'm going to say Fallout. No, I'm right. I, I agree. Fallout. Yeah, same, same for me. I think probably you could ask this question to 100 hardcore gamers, and you would probably get that response from 75 of them. Yeah. Oh, you got Tony Hawk on uh, the 25th. Okay, so uh, just a comment from the Lord X. Uh, the PlayStation blog confirmed that Gravity Rush Remastered is releasing February 9th, 2016 in North America and Europe. Nice. Uh, let's see. Question is today Saturday. If so, when are you guys going to start playing Super Mario Maker? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, our gaming valve for Super Mario Maker will be going up very soon. By the way, I had to finish up Metal Gear, and now I'm moving on to Super Mario Maker. Also, our uh, video eval for Metal Gear will be coming up very soon as well. So look out for that. I know I asked you guys before if you wanted us to put up the text version of gaming valves before the video versions were done. And you said yes, so that's the formula that we're following. Um, if you have any issues with that, then feel free to leave them in the comments. But that's kind of how we're going to roll. want to get the information out to you guys first. Uh, let's see. From True, True SB, I think that's how I say it. Uh, thoughts on what's next for Quantic Dreams? Oof. I bet they'd like to know that, too. Yeah. Um, I don't know. How did, how did Beyond Two Souls sell? Not exceptional. Mm. I mean, that seems to be one of the one of those teams that like Sony keeps around because Sony likes to have those like 
weird esoteric like. Well, wait, what happened with that whole wizard thing that they did? I thought they I said thought they were going to turn that into a game. I thought they said that was just like a pure demo. Like, well, I thought I it. read later on that they're like, well, actually, no, we are going to like mm. make a game based on that. And I will say that is one of the most impressive tech demos. Yeah, I that have was really ever good. Seen. <laughs> like, I would love it if they could build environments. In fact, I would just love if they made a game where they just kept the environment small. So that they could just pack, just make the game look as good as possible. I've never understood why no one's made a game this way. It's like, go into a mansion, and that game starts. And then you're trapped inside for the whole game until maybe the end. And then you can just spend all those polygons and all those effects on, like, one room. And just literally make the game just mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. Like... Naughty, Naughty Dog seems to have that philosophy, but with cities. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but just imagine, like, if Naughty Dog did that, and yeah. they put all that power into, like, one room. I mean, it would be near photorealistic. Yeah. I feel like you could do some really good stuff with VR where you're kind of taking a hit anyway because you're rendering everything twice. Like, I feel like if you kept yeah. things into confined spaces, you could make some VR stuff that could be yep. really stunning. And there was a little bit of that happening with PT. Yeah. Yeah, like just the smallness of it, it got, let the visual fidelity really, it lets really it sing, get yeah. high. So I don't honestly, we don't know what Quantic Dream's up to. I mean, I'm not a big yeah. fan of theirs. Like, I kind of I like liked having Heavy them Rain. around. Yeah, I mean, they provide something an alternative, but I didn't play their last game. I played it play at Beyond. trade shows, but I never finished it. I finished it. It was uh, it was fine. It was it was it was it was mostly Ellen Page. It yeah, was, it was Ellen Page. Selling their games that whole are thing. too quick time heavy for me, and normally I don't mind them that much. But when the whole game is a quick time event, like I just mm -hmm. can't get into it. Uh, okay, here's a, here's an off topic one. Oh, actually, well, well here's another one for, about TGS. Do you think TGS will will still be relevant three years from now from Rewind Play Labs? Sure. Relevant to who? Relevant to what? Yeah, yeah like, to who is the question. To me, maybe not. To, to me, I honestly don't know if that will be the case. Although, this this year has restored a little hope. Yeah. Just Sony's press conference alone has restored a little hope. Because otherwise, there isn't anything. I mean, if you think about it, we're a day into the show now, and pretty much the only thing we're talking about is the stuff that was in Sony's press conference. Mm -hmm. So, they kind of saved the show. Um, I think in three years, it's going to be almost all mobile. Probably. But here's the thing. I think by then, mobile will be much more relevant to us than it is now. Yeah, because yeah. you're going to have Nintendo on mobile, and that's going to be like a gateway drug for a lot of people on mobile, I feel like. Yeah. Well, also, I think you're going to, well, assuming Nintendo shows up, because Nintendo has foregone the TGS for many, many years. But, uh, well, they which, never go. They'll no, never go. Which made more sense when they did Space World, but uh, right. now they just don't show anything. Yeah. Um, but I also wonder, like, you know, mobile will obviously, you know, it's been taking over forever. I think it's Nintendo will be there with mobile, though. But the other thing is, I think VR is going to take off in Japan in, a big, in a big way. Um, I think that might be one of the places that embraces it fastest. I could see that. Um, and not just because of, like, oh, there's going to be crazy porn and VR or whatever, and, which obviously they are working on stuff like that over there because yeah. you've seen a lot of those weird things. But I think, you know, so much of... Um, you know, you know, everybody lives in small places, and it's a very crowded, you know, city, Tokyo, and all this. I wonder if, like, a device. That's that why I don't the, think it'll work. But no, I think it'll work. Because you need space. Well, yeah, but no, I don't even mean that. I mean, like, a, a device that, like, I don't think you need to be swinging around and doing Wii U, Wii stuff all the time. I mean, a device that lets you go outside. Oh, got you. Basically, I mean. You know, we didn't talk about Pokemon Go. Which I want to. Pokemon Go is going to be. Pokemon Go has been a game that's been in my head forever. Yeah, I, I, I totally screwed up setting up this show. We should have had a topic about Pokemon Go. Yeah. I could have cut a number of the topics that we had in the Big Six for Pokemon Go. That game looks awesome, by the way. We'll yeah. talk about it next week, even though it'll be old news. Like I want to talk about that game on this show, but anyway, and we're probably going off on a tangent anyway, talking about VR in Japan. <laughs> yeah, true. but I think that is going to be uh, in three years. I think VR is going to be a very significant presence at TGS. I think it might be. I, I still think the whole size of apartment thing is going to hold it back a little bit in that territory. I think they're just going to approach the VR thing differently there. Uh, let's see. Last of Us Two getting announced by accident. We actually talked about that earlier in the show. If you uh, join late, you have to watch that on the archive on Sifted.net. Um, very last question, and here's a fun one: What are your favorite beers? Oh, Fat Tire. Fat I Tire. I really like Fat Tire. I I have I put beer in tears. <laughs> like I have like you made beer cry. <laughs> <laughs> no. I have like beer that I like to drink when I'm at a cookout and mm. I'm going to be drinking all day in the sun. And if that's the case, I drink light beer and I drink Amstel Light. Hmm. 
And then I have beer that I drink like when I'm going out at night or if I'm like clubbing, and that would be Bex. Mm. And then I have beer that I drink when I'm trying to get really drunk, and that would be Chimay. All right. See, I'm not really a beer guy in general. I honestly, you know what? I don't drink a ton of beer anymore either. No. I used to when I was in college. Give me but gin. Now yeah. I drink vodka and Red Bull. <laughs> I still drink it's gin. It's a lot quicker and a lot more effective. <laughs> Makes a man mean. Yep. Everyone booze up and riot. Grey Goose and Red Bull for me. So if you ever see me somewhere and you want to buy me a drink, you can buy me a Grey Goose and Red Bull. That's, tr- that's true. I've seen you drink. And I will clang the glass with you gladly. So anyway, that's going to do it for this week's Game Face. As always, thanks to everybody who is watching. I know some of you guys are in Europe. And as always... Namaste for those of you who have stayed up in Europe to watch the show. Um, another great episode. Next week will be much less Japan-centric, I believe. Hmm. Uh, might be a little sports-centric, though, based upon the Uh-oh. release schedule, the way it's going right now. So little, little look FIFA. out for that. Uh-oh, a little FIFA, a little NHL, a little Pro, Evolu- Pro Evolution soccer getting huge scores. Yeah, big, big scores. People saying the best soccer game ever, at least until FIFA comes out next week. So we'll see about that. <laughs> But anyway, everybody have a great rest of the week and have a great weekend. We'll see you next week here on Game Face as we are up and out.